Welcome, hello, 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 and welcome everyone. This is For the Love of Comics. We've got this going. Okay. And here we go. Hello. Yeah, I think it's safe to turn my audio on now. Hi, welcome everyone. Welcome. This is For the Love of Comics and very warm welcome to all of you for yet another live stream. I've really enjoyed uh, doing these live streams. Those of you who've been here before, welcome back. Those of you who are catching our live stream of uh, For the Love of Comics for the first time, a very warm welcome. And for those of you watching a recording of it later, hope you can join us for a future live stream live. But hopefully this is still a fun video to watch um, later as a recording and this video is going to be one of my top 10 lists and it was a top 10 list that I knew I wanted to make as soon as something happened and I'll give you the context um, in just a little bit but the more I thought about it and the more I worked on this list the more massive it became as a video project as an edited video project of what to do in b-roll and how many things I wanted to talk about and uh, those of you familiar with my top 10 lists know that my disclaimers and caveats and whether this qualifies or not or how I should create a parameter, those things became so overwhelming that I just wasn't getting the video made. So I figured, you know what, uh, it's a top 10 favorite comics list. Those are, if nothing else, those are the videos I should be able to do on the fly. I don't need to have much preparation. All I need are the comics. And that was another thing, getting all the comics out. But I really thought that of all my top 10s, this one was one that I would really enjoy doing live because I do want to get people's opinions on these things. Even if I can't focus on the chat uh, all the time, I know they'll be there and I want other people's top 10s. I want other people's choices. And uh, it's also something that... I think can be quite, um, I don't want to say controversial, but I think there can be a lot of discussion. But what am I talking about? Let me rewind really quick and settle in for some context. Uh, 30 years ago, 
seven superstars of American comics walked out of Marvel and DC to start their own publishing company, to start their own comics publisher named Image Comics. About a month ago, a fellow YouTuber off my shelves got in touch with me asking me to contribute to his collage video in which he was going to ask a dozen or more comics YouTubers to submit their single favorite image comic of all time. And everyone could submit just one. So between these two momentous historic occasions, the founding of Image and this collaborative video being made, between these two occasions, Image Comics has published hundreds. And I mean, I thought it was an exaggeration until I looked up the list, you know, in order to do my prep work. I looked up the list of Image Comics, literally hundreds of titles, uh, long series, standalone graphic novels, miniseries, one shots, reprints, you name it. And those hundreds of comics to try to boil that down to one single absolute favorite was just a ridiculous, foolhardy task that I think was a fantastic thing to set for people. And I think it really challenged them to come up with just one pick out of such a, you know, extensive and varied library. And that video is something I really encourage all of you to check out as well. I'll link it below after this live stream is over, where you have a number of people giving their one single image comic pick as their favorite. But those of you who know me and know this channel know that that was absolute torture. Um, as it turns out, it wasn't too difficult to come up with one single title. And I'll get into the reasons why later. But I wanted to talk about more comics. And I was glad to see some people uh, in that video talk about some of the comics I wanted to talk about. But there were a lot, as I said, Image has a lot of comics. So there were a lot of comics that I wanted to talk about. And I thought that, no, you know, I have to make a top 10. And even that top 10 was a really difficult list to make. But today on this live stream, that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the 10 comics that I ended up selecting as my top 10 image comics of all time. And just 10 comics. That's all I'm going to talk about. And that's not true. Of course, it's not true. I have about 50 comics, I think, that I ended up pulling from my shelves. And then I've done a little bit of shortlisting. So I think my final count is about 38 or something that's sitting around over here. And not all of them are honorable mentions, but a lot of them are honorable mentions because they won't make that final 10. But just because they don't make that final 10 doesn't mean that they're not worthwhile comics, doesn't mean that they're not worth reading and enjoying and rereading and owning. And I think a lot of people might say that they are far more worthwhile than something I've picked, just in the way that I would disagree with them, because that's the nature of lists. They're really a reflection of our personal tastes and maybe even autobiography, where I was when I first read that, how impactful that was, because that was the first time I ever saw something like that. That personal angle makes every top 10, everybody's top 10, very unique, not just from some sort of an objective evaluation of story and storytelling, but also from what appeals to you, what your biases are, and of course, your personal history. So I want to talk about a bunch of different comics in a variety of different ways uh, today. And I leave the final top 10. Interestingly enough, I think I leave that up to you to decide what my top 10 actually was, because I'm going to, of course, have caveats and disclaimers. And there are going to be certain reasons why some things may not qualify, or I may have a certain thought process that I will question myself as I go through this video. I will second guess myself and I will... I'm not going to be definitive. No matter what I say at any one moment, the very next moment it could change or over the course of what looks to be a pretty lengthy video, it might change. So I leave it up to you at the end to decide what my top 10 eventually ended up being. I do have a list written down as if that's what I'm going to stick to. But I did put 
A, a lot of comics all around me right now, and B, the more I thought about my reasons, I started debating with myself. So rather than spend a lot of time right at the top of this video talking about my caveats, disclaimers, parameters, the kind of things I usually do at the beginning of top 10 videos, instead of doing all of that, I'm just going to jump into the list. And I'll talk about my caveats and disclaimers and uh, the systems that I used uh, to evaluate what makes my list and what I want to talk about. I'll talk about those things as I go through the list. So in a very rare occurrence, no more waffling around. Uh, let's jump straight into the list. At least let's jump into one of the uh, books that I know is on my top 10. And a minor spoiler, if you haven't seen that video um, at Off My Shelves' uh, channel that I was talking about, if you haven't seen that, I'm going to start with what I picked over there. Because for those of you who have seen it, let's get that out of the way and then we can talk about the other comics. So I ended up saying my absolute favorite image comic of all time was Astro City. Uh, particularly Astro City Volume 1, because that was published by Image. Then it moved on to an imprint, and then it moved, and it was sold, and then it, Vertigo got it, so DC owned it and was publishing it. It's had an interesting publication history. But even if you count Wildstorm, and I do, by the way, I count all of those imprints by the seven creators or the six creators who ended up starting their own imprints as part of Image, I count them all as image. I don't count other businesses those people may have owned, but Wildstorm Comics, which was Jim Lee's part of image, was Jim Lee's uh, imprint. Uh, Wildstorm Comics published image, but the first, the first six stories were published by image. So it's at least this, at least this volume is uncontroversially image comics. And this is a superb comic. Astro City is one of my favorite comics of all time. It's definitely my favorite superhero comic or definitely in there, um, top three, if I was to make a favorite superhero comics of all time thing. And the reason why is because it is, uh, as I was saying in that other video, it's a deconstruction, some people say. It's an examination of superheroes from a realistic perspective. And all of these things... And the art by Brent Anderson is just a fantastic mixture of classic and modern. It's evocative, but not show-offy. It doesn't, you know, it's it, it lets the storytelling come to the center. When you need action sequences, you get action sequences. When you get close, quiet moments, you get close, quiet moments. But the beauty of Astro City is its slightly askew view at superheroes. It looks at superhero lives and the moments that don't get talked about in superhero comics or don't get the kind of highlighting that this comic gives them. And very often, this talks about the man on the street, the sort of thing that writer Kurt Busiek had brought to Marvels, where it was all from um, Phil Sheldon, the, 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 the person telling the story wasn't a superhero, wasn't involved in superheroics, was observing them from a distance. And to a certain extent, that's there in a number of other comics where you've got a proxy for you and I, the common man reader, you've got a proxy in the story and you're getting it from that angle. The collection of stories over here in the first volume switch between ones that have to do with the superhero and are giving you the superhero's point of view, but about things that you don't think about superheroes thinking about or being interested in, or you never really wonder how they do that part of it. It's that kind of aspect of the superheroes, or you're getting someone removed. You're getting a man on the street. You're getting someone who's adjacent to their lives somehow. And with this slightly askew view, over many, many years and many, many volumes, Kurt Busiek, Alex Ross, who is not just the person who does the covers, but is also the person who designs these superheroes, the, the many dozens who populate this wonderful series, and Brent Anderson, the artist, they've been bringing us the series for many years, and it's always stayed fresh. That's the, that's the final fascinating thing about Astro City for me, how with the 
there's one particular storyline, the Dark Age storyline, which is not bad. It's only in comparison to the rest of Astro City. To me, it doesn't quite live up, um, or at least it didn't when I first read it. It has gotten better. But every other volume is fresh and surprising and original and at the same time continues to build on things that we have seen before. It's it's really good long form continuity superhero storytelling where it's this universe and their history and the story of what has happened in Astro City over the decades, what has happened to these superheroes over the decades is given to you piecemeal. It's not all in one go and it's not in chronological order. There are flashbacks, there are references, and there are circle backs to references you've had before. So it builds a nice, deep, rich, textured mythology while still making great standalone stories that all can be an entry point into the series. That craft of it is something not many comics can do. Uh, fans of uh, uh, Usagi Yojimbo will know that I've talked about why that makes Usagi Yojimbo such a great series, that you can just jump in at any point of time and you'll get the history and you'll get the story built for you. And Astro City does a very similar thing. So... Between that video and this video, I still don't think I would have covered everything there is to say. But if um, I, I think one of the problems with Astro City was as much as I have praised it and recommended it over the years, many people I talk to have had trouble getting their hands on it because it just goes out of print. Even when you had new editions brought out by Vertigo, even they didn't seem to last for very long. So people always seem to have difficulty getting their hands on Astro City, especially the earlier volumes. And recently I heard that volumes 1, 2, and 3 were going to be published in a paperback omnibus, uh, a Metro, I think it's called the Metro book. And that's just great news because I know there's a an ocean of people out there wanting to read Astro City and not being able to get their hands on it. So I'm really happy to now be able to recommend it with an edition coming up. That one's going to have volume one, two, and most of volume three, but you should definitely continue with it because um, volume four, Tarnished Angel, is a superb take on noir. Uh, again, an askew view of the superheroes, the down on his luck, hard-bitten private investigator, out of his depth, done through superhero sidekicks and an investigation and a case that works brilliantly as a noir inner city investigation works really well as an exploration of superheroes um, in, at, at the same time. So volume four, volume five, volume six, they're all really, really good. And I highly recommend Astro City. And that's why I had no trouble picking this as definitely as one of my top 10 and the reason I picked it as my number one pick is it's just that kind of a personal favorite thing. When I think about comics that I absolutely love, I'm not necessarily talking about technical expertise. I'm not necessarily, to I mean, all of those things matter, but there is a tilt factor involved in how it affected you and how you get into it and how much you enjoy it. And I also think Astro City is a very accessible series. It's something that can appeal to people who have only read superhero comics and nothing else. It can appeal to people who've never read superhero comics and maybe just watched movies and TV and have an idea about uh, how superhero comics are, but they haven't been interested in it. It's really appealing for any comics fan and also, I would say, a great gateway comic. So because of these reasons, because of that level of accessibility, um, I felt in spite of the flood of choices that I had in picking my favorite image comic, that's why I picked Astro City as being the number one. It's not necessarily the best, although, of course, to a certain extent, I feel it is, but I think everything I have here is among the best. So it's I'm not going to rank the top 10, by the way. I'm not going to say this is number nine, this is number one. But I did, and that's why I'm starting with Astro City, I did say this is number one. But that's the reason why, is for its incredible accessibility. It's, a, you know, the, the way it can appeal to a wide demographic, a wide readership, and find something, um, you know, it, it'll find people 
who love it in all of those groups. So that's my first pick in my top 10 image comics, Astro City. Non-controversial. Uh, maybe the last time we have something non-controversial. Okay, so, well, I just launched right into things, but I do want to quickly check to see if I have any questions or if my technical stuff is all okay, but looks like people are... Good to see everyone here. Good to see a lot of familiar faces, uh, a lot of new faces. Hello, hello. Welcome if it's your first time. Um, okay, great. Within the first 30 minutes. Yes, Tommy, I, I know. But now I can ramble and now I can. I, I've started off strong and peaked early. <laughs> um, we've got people writing down their lists on the chat already. That's fantastic. I'm not going to comment on these lists right now because you never know what's coming up. Uh, good morning, Sleepy Reader. Good morning, uh, Comics vs. The World. Sean Butterly, Metal Shake, Domenico, Masterminds, Rosen, uh, Meghadatya, Samuel. Hello, hello, everyone. Let me see. Setu, good to see you. Ulrich, hello there. Great to see everyone over here. The Drunken Sailor. Just saying hello. Yes, I'll see you back on the VOD. Um, Tommy says that the paperback volume should be something that Image should stop doing. I mean, and I kind of understand why. But we're talking as people who collect hardcovers and who collect deluxe editions, things like that. Uh, and I think that's great. But those hardcovers seem to be very hard to keep in print, especially because... Uh, the slimmer the hardcover, and I love slim hardcovers, the slimmer the hardcover, the more expensive it is on a unit cost. So while I love those editions for connoisseurs and aficionados and things like that, I really want a good series like this to be read. So therefore, you know, when you have the Usagi Yojimbo saga and it collects all of these that Dark Horse did the paperback versions of, I know people who are very excited about the hardcovers and the limited editions, Again, the collectors. But as far as reading Usagi Yojimbo is concerned, I, I, I just think it's great that it's there. I want something affordable. I want something easily available out there for people so that they can read a great series. And Astro City definitely qualifies. So in spite of me liking hardcovers and me looking for those kind of editions, I'm never going to complain about someone keeping something in print, bringing something back in print and making it affordable and accessible. John, good to see you. Um, Oklahoma, welcome. All right, so that was, that was my first selection. Now, already I need to refer to my notes to make sure I don't go off track. Uh, that's not the right notes. I just opened up some work notes. Um, there we go, that's better. All right, so after Astro City, what I want to do is talk about a couple of what I consider the big guns. And let's see um, how this goes, because when talking about image comics, I think everyone over here, um, if you're not familiar, that's one thing, but anyone who's vaguely familiar with, with image comics will have at least one or two definitive series. They will say, when I think of image, I think of that. And that doesn't mean that that's their favorite. It doesn't mean that that's the best, even in their opinion, but it's just something that you associate with the publisher, a particular series that you associate with the publisher. And some of them are very famous and some of them are very long running. And so therefore, I want to, I want to start off uh, the list, the rest of this list by talking about some of those. Um, so let's say, the elephants in the room and whether they make my list or not. Now, first of all, I will confess that when looking through the list of Image Comics, I will confess that I hadn't read at least half of them, probably more. Uh, when I went through my shelves and I was picking out everything that said Image on it, I ended up with around, I would say, 60. 60 titles. I don't mean volumes. So if I have five volumes of one series, I'm still counting that as one series, but many of them, and some of this is because of Image's very nice introductory pricing or volume one pricing, many of them, I just had a single volume. It's, it, it was a good way for me to try out a series for cheap, and if I'm interested in it, then I buy further volumes. So 
my future caveats will also come to this is something I only bought one volume of. This is something I followed up to volume two and then I didn't. And this is something I bought more or this is something I decided to get in hardcover. That's also a sort of reflection on what I felt. Uh, but again, I don't mean that this is not they're not worthwhile. It's just the level that they interested me and the level they hooked me to. So from when looking at all of this and realizing that I haven't read more than half of what Image has published, uh, you've got to understand that that's always the case for any top 10. But in this particular case, maybe you will wonder why this isn't on my top 10. And it is a very good chance the reason it's not on my top 10 is because I haven't read any or I haven't read enough to actually have a you know, uh, an informed opinion to be able to evaluate it against something I have read. And I think for some of these big guns, um, that might be the case. So let's talk about three image comics that sort of are, the carry the brand image. That's what people think of when they think about image. And I'm thinking about Saga, Invincible, and The Walking Dead. Uh, and, and and these are r relatively new, but uh, Walking Dead and Invincible being long running uh, started a while ago. But th there are others, of course. But let's say Saga, Invincible and The Walking Dead. Do any of these three make my top 10? I will say immediately that The Walking Dead does not. And the reason The Walking Dead does not is because I haven't read that much of The Walking Dead. I've read one maybe two trade paperbacks worth. I think it was a, it wasn't a compendium. It was, it was like a slightly fatter thing. I had borrowed it from my friend. So I think it was two trades. I read the first two trades and it wasn't like, it wasn't like, um, I thought it was bad. I thought it was interesting, but it didn't hook me. It didn't feel like something absolutely new. And I realized that might come much later with something that ran for as many issues as it did the, ability to develop complexity further down the road uh, after you've created certain foundations, it, it will always exist. I don't know because I never read that far. I don't think The Walking Dead is a bad comic. It just didn't appeal to me way back in the day when I read it. And this is before the TV show and anything like that. It was just something, um, uh, it, it was just something that a friend really, really recommended. And I think that friend has very good taste. And that's the reason why I was interested in reading it. It just didn't appeal to me that much. So unfortunately, there's no uh, The Walking Dead. Primarily, I would say because I haven't read as much of it as I should. Invincible is... Now, this is where I'm going to get into trouble with all of these piles. I'm very scared of dropping things. Uh, but... Invincible is something I have read, but it doesn't make my top 10 either because I haven't read all of it. I've read more of it as far as the run of the entire series is concerned, but I started reading it in these editions and I haven't been able to find further editions. I have really enjoyed what I read of this. I think Invincible is, let me, if you're, if you haven't seen it, Invincible has a very clean, almost uh, animated look to it. It's extremely violent. It's extremely adult. Uh, and you don't expect it because when you see this art, it, it looks like classic comic books. Uh, and when you see the violence that erupts on the page, it has a uniquely shocking feeling to it. But that's not the reason why Invincible is so enjoyable. I, I, I guess it could be part of it. But for me, that wasn't the main thing. The, what, what really makes it as smart as it is, is that it sets itself up as a perfect superhero story. It's very, very classic. But it keeps undermining and examining and playing with the classic superhero story. Very differently from say something like Astro City, which is about an expansion to say these are things that always exist and we just don't notice it. Um, this, on the other hand, is doing different things, almost as if 
if you've grown up reading superhero comics and if the heroes in your stories have grown up reading superhero comics, how would they approach things? And then how do you subvert those expectations? It's that level of playfulness and that, I, you know, I don't want to say meta because it never gets so arch, at least as far as I've read, that it seems to be sort of winking at you directly and breaking the fourth wall. Again, I don't want to get into spoilers, but it isn't, it isn't a... It isn't an academic metatextual examination of superheroes. It's not trying to be arch and brainy. It's trying to be fun. And that's that propulsive nature of the story of what's the next fun thing? What's the next big thing? How do I one-up what has come before? Because a superhero comic always has to one-up. Once you face this threat, how can something less than that be interesting? All of these become questions as far as the storytelling of Invincible is concerned. But not having read the full story and not having gotten to how the story concluded, which by all accounts I hear was very satisfying. And I, I don't really hear a lot of people who are fans of Invincible say they were let down with the way the series went, which is very encouraging. But when comparing it to the things that I have read and the things that I have finished and the way that I hold them as favorites in my head, I can't quite get to Invincible taking one of those positions. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe as I talk about the others, I won't be as sure of one. And Invincible then might be one of those that can slip into the top 10 by displacing something else. I don't know. Maybe. Let's see. But right now, having read five out of 12 volumes... Uh, so it's a little less than half. I don't find myself with the ability to call Invincible into my top 10, given what is in my top 10. And uh, that leaves us with uh, Saga, which actually does make my top 10. Unfortunately, for some who don't like this comic, and this is... Um, I didn't know that this was a polarizing comic. I didn't know that... There were people who absolutely hated this comic. I thought it was a widely beloved, very successful, sales-busting, uh, meme-generating uh, juggernaut. But, of course, there's no thing that has absolutely no critics. But here's the interesting thing is I've talked to a lot of people of what they don't like about Saga. By the way, if you're not familiar, Saga is a space opera. And it is a space opera in the absolute sense of that word. It feels very dramatic. It's it's about war and it's about family and it's about the bonds that bind us and it's about betrayal. So it's classic soap opera and, you know, singing opera type of stuff um, in a Star Wars, Guardians of the Galaxy, planet hopping fantasy because there's magic in it, sci-fi yarn. Um, again, very uh, grown up from the point of view of sex and violence and all kinds of transgressive behavior. And that's part of the criticism from some people of where this kind of thing is just for shock value. It's just uh, salacious or it doesn't really have much substance. And while I can see what they're saying, I don't necessarily agree with it because the reason why I like Saga is the characters. The family unit at the core of it won me over in spite of myself. I did at the beginning think, all right, this is going to really push this lovers from differing sides of the war and their baby. Uh, this is not a spoiler because that's pretty much page one. But I thought mm, that's going to be a little too much for me. But in spite of myself, I found myself charmed by the characters. I found myself charmed by their the way they speak. And again, this is something... That might be, you know, to some people's taste and some people's, uh, some people may not like it. A certain kind of banter or a certain kind of whip smart back and forth. Uh, it might feel very artificial to people. In this case, for the most, it works for me. And I think that's the most important thing to me about Saga is I don't deny any of the criticisms that... I've heard leveled against it. The pop cultural references, the voiceover narration. Uh, these are all things I understand and I agree with. And 
the fact that I don't dismiss that, but I can overlook those. In fact, find moments where the voiceover narration, which generally is not something I enjoy, I can find it used really cleverly, really well, with emotional resonance and moving the story forward, closing out a chapter, segueing to another time, done very, very adroitly. So even the things that I'm not a fan of, there'll be some things like pop cultural references to 20th century Earth life that really sound anachronistic to me as far as a space opera is concerned. So I don't know if I can find excuses for those, but there are other things that I have an objection to that I don't like, and then the comic overcomes that. And it's the comic's ability because of its plot and because of its character relations to constantly overcome the kind of criticisms I can throw at it and do it over and over again in the way that it's done that makes it so so much fun. Uh, I don't think of it as a guilty pleasure. I just think of it as a pleasure. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I understand it's not to everyone's tastes, but I also think that's something that can be said for almost all of image. Not to everyone's taste can be applied maybe to this list, but particularly to certain titles that I'm leaving off this list. And image has really made its reputation by doing that. And that's odd because they're not now anymore. They're not like Marvel or DC. They don't have a universe of characters that they hire. up. They, they publish stories that are creator-owned and that the creators want to write about and the creators want to draw. That's, that's what they do um, as a publishing company. So the fact that they will have a unifying editorial vision of any kind doesn't really make sense because it's all about the variety coming in from your creators. But they've gotten a reputation for speculative fiction. They've gotten a reputation for sci-fi, for fantasy, for having things that are outlandish, for having things that are bold today. It's not necessarily the way they started out, although maybe it was always that way. And the fact that they're able to get that sort of identity of being publishers who put stuff out there that some people are going to squirm at, that some people are not going to like, and other people are really going to love because they don't see anything else out there. That's the only thing that really unites a lot of different image comics. And I think that's kind of what Saga is doing. That's what a lot of these comics do, is that they have a peculiar oddball voice and sometimes it can be a little much where you're like okay that's just trying to be odd or wanting to be odd and that's the only thing over there but the greatest stories coming out of image really capitalize on that capitalize on that sort of polarizing uh, approach you're not going to find you're not going to find a lot in image that is just universally i mean saga uh, you know walking dead and even if you think about these comics, they're very odd. They're very, you know, they're not mainstream fiction, if, if there is such a thing. And making that mainstream is also one of the great achievements of, uh, uh, of image. So, yes, I won't put The Walking Dead on my list. I won't put Invincible on my list yet. Um, but I will put Saga on, on my list just because it overcomes it overcomes uh, my my objections. Sleepy Reader, thank you. Thank you so much for that super chat. That is much, much appreciated. Hardbacks and deep comic book thoughts funding. I can promise you one of those things, but thank you very much. Much appreciated. All right, so Saga makes my list. Invincible does not. The Walking Dead does not. All right, let me put these away. Now, I just want to quickly talk about Oh, yeah, sorry, I, I, I didn't mention the art of Saga, but I really was talking about it altogether. So usually I don't talk about, I think sometimes people think I talk about writing because I keep saying story. And I, I've, I've, I've tried to explain this or express myself better. For me in comics, story is writing and art. So writing and art put together is story. I don't use the word story to mean writing. Um, I think sometimes... It happens, and we can use the word story to mean plot, but I think plot is different from story. Plot is a component. Story and storytelling 
is about everything. So just when you think someone's a great storyteller, you don't just think about the vocabulary. You think about their inflection. You think about their pacing. You think about how they edit and how they choose what they are going to say. That's the same thing for all mediums. So in comics, I, I, but, but I agree. Fiona Staples' art is really good. Um, there are, again, certain objections where I'm, I'm sometimes a little... Um, I wonder why the backgrounds are so stark and why they're so flat. You know, uh, background detail, especially in sci-fi, especially in big epic sci-fi, background detail tends to be thrown in there at all times. It's kind of like, um, I forget, of course I would forget now, I think the word is greebling. I, at least I've heard it in Lego. <laughs> greebling is just like stuff you throw on there, like the Millennium Falcon. It's just stuff. Like, what does that pipe do? What is that? Con I don't know. It doesn't have a scientific reason. It just looks cool if you put in a whole bunch of pipes and a whole bunch of things. So I think sometimes artwork um, in the background can be a bit like greebling. But most of the time, I really like it because it helps me have a sense of space. And Fiona Staples' art is gorgeous. Her character work, her colors are beautiful. And sometimes I've been, mm, I wish there was more in the background. But I think, um, and this is similar to, I think, what I had uh, as, as, as a, not an objection, but as a thought for Why the Last Man way back when I was reading it. As like, this story is really propulsive, but why are so many of the, you know, panels just a blue background? Or why is it so plain? And I felt, uh, as I read that series, as I read Saga, I felt that it actually helps the speed of the story. I think it's, I mean, I wouldn't call it like manga, but I think it's very similar to which if you're supposed to move along or if you're supposed to get this piece of dialogue and this conversation, not everything has to be filled in. And so I think that sort of selective decision making of when to show detail and when not to show detail might end up being another one of those things is something I think of as a weakness when I first see it. And then when I realize how quickly I've galloped through something or how the impact of a particular moment has has landed like a punch, it's kind of because of that is because... That's how those panels went. So, yeah, I think it's fantastic art. I think it is really um, uh, lovely art. Monthly comics are hard to provide with backgrounds. Yes, and I think that's true. And I think that there are larger collaborative teams. Sometimes when people work on backgrounds and you have a team or you have assistants, you have artists. Um, uh, of course, on this channel, we've talked about Bob DeMoor and other studio, Hergé, people who collaborated and, and, and made the backgrounds of the Tintin comics, the things I love. I didn't know that some of these things were redrawn until much, you know, much, much later in life. And I can't think of those plain backgrounds. I can only think of those detailed backgrounds. So yes, for a monthly, it would be, but then Saga goes on hiatus. And I, anyway, I, I do think, I do think Saga is worthwhile. And I do think it is a, a great comic for me. And it's a very enjoyable comic. Again, not for everyone, but I know I started with Astro City, but I I don't think there's going to be stuff on this list just because of image being image, as we were saying, um, that's going to be for everyone. Um, while we're on the topic of Brian K. Vaughan, or while we're talking about Brian K. Vaughan, I just had a copy of The Private Eye over here as an example of what I'm not counting in this list. Uh, although this is published by image in its print form. Uh, the Private Eye was originally published by the Panel Syndicate. It's an online pay what you want to pay read. And it's the print version that was put out by image. Uh, not saying that it would have made my top 10, but it just doesn't qualify because I'm only in this making of this list, I'm only going to be counting comics that started, that were originated by image. Not when, not, not, and it's similar to what I did for my Dark Horse video in which I didn't want to talk about things that came from other publishers. Now, that's interesting uh, because comics and American comics have this, this, this storied history where they've been through many publishers and they were being published in independent anthologies and things like that before they ever became famous. So it's always a little bit of a question of how far do you really, you know, where do you want to draw that line if 
Mike Mignola first put Hellboy into some comic or a version of Hellboy into some comic that wasn't Dark Horse, are you really going to say that it's not a Dark Horse series or it's not a Dark Horse character? Um, but if something ran for years, I think it's fairly non-controversial. If it existed at another publisher and then moved to Image, or if it was originally published by another publisher and then Image republished it or reprinted it, I'm not counting it for this list. It's, of course, just as it was with the Dark Horse video and all my other caveats, it is, of course... Uh, to the credit of that editorial and that publishing team uh, to put that out there. Even if you continue a series, those are new stories that you're doing, but not for this list. So that also leaves out, for me, um, Stray Bullets, which is one of my favorite comics of all time. Possibly, it's the best crime comic I've ever read. It it blows everything else away. Uh, it's it's kind of like if you talk about crime comics, you put stray bullets over here and everything else over here to compete with each other just because it seems so unaffected and so raw and so real and so authentic with stark, clean black and white art. But the moments and the way the time is magnified and erupted, the way the characters get under your skin, even the most unlikable characters are indelible. And the likable, there aren't that many likable characters, but as a saga of crime with multiple characters intersecting and crisscrossing each other's lives, uh, Stray Bullets is unparalleled. But Stray Bullets was published by... El Capitan, which is David Lapham's company. It's a self-published comic all the way up to issue 40. Now, I'm talking here about the original Stray Bullets, not the subsequent series that have followed. So Stray Bullets went up to issue 40 in El Capitan, and then you had um, a huge break in which the story remained unfinished until many years later, issue number 41 was brought out by Image Comics. They completed the series by publishing the final chapter. Um, issues 1 through 40 have some of the most uh, erratic, sporadic publishing schedules uh, you'll see. But after issue 41, Image started publishing Stray Bullets. And they brought out the Uber Rallies edition, and then they brought out... Um, new Stray Bullets stories. So I think they started with The Killers, which I have... Um, in single issues, but I haven't kept up with Stray Bullets after The Killers. And even if I wanted to put Killers on this list, I kind of wouldn't because to me, the original 40, 41 issues of Stray Bullets are absolutely crucial and absolutely vital reading, essential reading. And that's not going to be image, although I do appreciate them bringing this series back and finishing it off and putting it out there in that edition, uh, just like I was saying earlier about Astro City, is there now putting these stories. So you've got Sunshine and Roses and a bunch of others that I really have to, I have to catch up on. But Stray Bullets, magnificent series, absolutely top recommendation from me if I could ever give, um, but not image as far as my consideration for this video is concerned and doesn't qualify. And, you know, that's, that's that's the same for things like Bone, because Bone, for four issues, was actually published by Image. It started off being published by Cartoon Books, uh, which is, again, self-publishing by Jeff Smith. And then a bunch, uh, four issues came out from Image, and Image reprinted everything up to issue 20. I think they started with 21 or 22, and they reprinted everything from issue one. So if you're looking for single issues of Bone, you can actually find Cartoon Books issues of one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. You could find the second printing, one, two, three, four, five. And then you could find the Image Comics reprinting, one, two, three, four, five, up to 24. But Image only originally published four of these stories, reprinting the ones that came before that. And the relationship didn't last for very long. And Bone moved back to cartoon books to finish it off. So that little blip in Bone's history in which it was with Image does not qualify Bone to be an image comic, which is very good because that leaves a spot in the top 10 for other comics. But I think that's fairly non-controversial. I don't think anyone thinks of Bone as, um, as an image comic. So what, we, what, what that brings me to 
I'm just making sure I've got this uh, thing. So um, what that brings me to is comics that Image published from the beginning and are creating an identity. We talked about these three big ones, but there are actually really big ones uh, from the beginning of Image's history. And over here, I guess, the big three would be Spawn, Savage Dragon, and Youngblood. Now, the interesting thing is, and this, I did not know this until I looked this up, but apparently Savage Dragon by Eric Larson and Youngblood by Rob Liefeld were originally published in some other, like they were creator-owned characters, but they were originally published in some form in some other comic, in some other anthology or collection or something like that before, obviously, as being two of the founders of Image, Eric Larson and Rob Liefeld brought them over and started publishing them with issue one. And so so they would still count. You know, I, I, I wouldn't take that little bit of a blip to be um, not image. But I haven't read much of Savage Dragon. I think I've read like two issues and they were random issues uh, unconnected to each other. And I, I have seen his appearance in another image, like a crossover sort of story. I've never read any Young Blood, or I think I may have read an issue of Young Blood and deleted it from my memory banks. I'm not sure. Um, I've never been that interested in them, honestly, uh, even though Savage Dragon is one of the longest running comics of all time, as of course is Spawn uh, as a single series. Uh, these have been running for a long time. Now, Spawn, I have read, I'd say about maybe 12 issues in my whole life. And I think maybe one of them was a three issue arc and the others were, I, I wasn't that interested i i wasn't that thrilled i mean i read 12 issues um but even when i read it when, and i was young i was maybe 18 years old or something when i first even when i read it it seemed like not my cup of tea it didn't seem like something i was interested in it it's and i think there's some criticism i've heard of early image comics that they really focused on the artwork and the character design and the covers and them being cool and gritted teeth and things like that, uh, muscles. Uh, it could be all just prejudice, but uh, that's the impression I have. But from my limited reading of Spawn and the little bit of Young Blood that I've read, I, let's just say it wasn't to my taste. So even though these are three big ones as far as image are concerned, none of them make my top 10. And I'm fine with that. Uh, you know, maybe if I read a lot more Spawn, I'd somehow find my opinion transformed, but I seriously doubt it. So I feel comfortable leaving uh, these three off my top 10. What does come from around the same time and does make my top 10 is the Max, which is just an extraordinary comic. And I've talked about the Max in one of my recent reads videos. I, I did a superhero spotlight in which I only talked about superhero comics, sort of as a joke, because people say I don't talk about superhero comics that much. But the Max is not a superhero comic. I mean, I guess you could think of it as a superhero comic, and it definitely sets itself up to be that way. But this is an extraordinary comic from the very earliest days of Image, which is like nothing else that I've encountered from that time, or honestly, even since then. I think if you want to think about what Image Comics can be, I think you should think about the Max from like 1992 or 1993, where, where it started. It is a look at a super-powered being, creature, who is just a homeless person living in a box, you know, in an alley, urban poverty. So this is the Max, and that's, uh, you know, and this, is, uh, and this is where he's living. And the whole, the whole comic, and this is the layouts, the design, the, the, the interaction of the action and the thinking behind it, 
the initial chapters and the initial pages are just a teaser for what's going to come next. You've got nightmarish scenarios that sort of bleed into reality, but never lose their cartoonishness, which in some way makes them a lot more menacing. But what really fascinates me about the Max is how it is about damage and trauma and the the, the sort of recesses we retreat to and how we try to combat the pain that we hold inside of ourselves through these different characters. There's an Australia, which is not the Australia we know, but this imaginary Australia, which is another dimension into which this uh, this superhero, he's not really a superhero, but into which this hero goes. And he has these nightmare battles and fights in which he is trying to win against something. And these are, are they imagined? Are they real? Are they both imagined and real? Is he bleeding across dimensions or is he just mentally ill? That's that, that's pretty good right there at the beginning uh, to be a hook. But the series doesn't stay on that. That's just that's just what you get in the first few issues. And then it becomes something else. Then it becomes something else. And I will admit that somewhere in the middle of this series, which I ended up getting in most of them, I got in these slim hardcover uh, maximized editions. But there was one volume that was really hard to find. So I ended up picking up all six of those or five of those issues in singles so so that I could read the whole story. And somewhere in the middle, the Max kind of, I wouldn't say loses it, but it gets really strange and really weird and very offbeat. And there's things going on with storytelling and there's things going on with art and text and design presentation, which seems to be a, almost the author working issues out on paper through the metaphor that he's created. So it can be slightly inaccessible or slightly incoherent in the middle. But I think it kind of comes out of it in 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 a completely different shape that it went into, sort of like a butterfly. And the whole thing is so ambitious and so unique and so unlike anything you'll read, as I said, not just from the 90s, but even today, that it feels like watching <clears throat> you know, it, it feels like watching a master at work and it's okay if you only get some of it and don't get the rest of it. You're still happy enough to be in that audience. You're still happy enough to have this in front of you. So, yeah, I, I mean, I feel kind of odd putting it alongside Spawn, Savage Dragon and Young Blood. And again, very prejudiced because I admit, you know, I haven't read as many of those. I feel odd putting it there because it, it doesn't seem to belong to the same universe, even though Savage Dragon shows up in one of the early Max stories. You know, I don't know if there were still or if there were plans to have a shared universe or they were just going to have each other's characters show up in different imprints. Uh, I'm not sure about the story behind that, but it doesn't feel it, it, it's like Batman showing up in the early issues of the Sandman. You know, it just it, that's not that's not what this is about. And this is going to work in a completely different way. Um, so I have no qualms about putting the Max on my list of top 10 image comics, even though I'm not putting those those other ones in there. Um Sam Keith could draw the Sandman Max crossover. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, yeah, I also uh, there's a there's a series of videos made by uh, Uncle Jerk Jerk Comics. You should check out this YouTube channel if you haven't. He's made a series of videos on how the Max broke Sam Keith, and he's got detailed. It's incredible the kind of research this guy does. And it's a superb series of videos. I haven't gotten through everything because it's so dense, but there are five parts. There's long interviews. I don't know if Sam Keith's interested in the Max anymore from what I could gather uh, from those interviews, but you never know. Um, Savage Garden is absolutely not only about the art. Yeah, so I should read more Savage Garden. Uh, Savage Garden. <laughs> Savage Dragon. Um, all right, no other questions over here. Um, 
Okay, so moving along. So we've got the Max making my list, those others not making my list. Something else that was there in the early days uh, of Image, I think, is also something that was revitalized. And this is Supreme, which I, again, like Youngblood, and I think more in the case of Supreme because I read this, this Supreme first, which is Alan Moore's take on Supreme. Now, this is a very unusual cover because this cover and this story inside are probably the most mismatched cover and story I've ever seen. What I later read uh, about Supreme, or what I later read of Supreme, is very much like this. What's inside this comic, what's inside what Alan Moore's take on Supreme is something very, very different. If you if you take a look at these pages, for example, you'll see what's going on over here is something he did before this with Miracle Man and what he did after this with Tom Strong. And this re... Uh, what can I say? Reimagination of this powerful superhero character that existed in Image Comics to become a examination, deconstruction, you know, the kind of things Alan Moore does of superhero comics through the ages, the golden age, the silver age, uh, revisions, how are things rewritten, how are things updated, uh, what is relative, uh, you know, what is relatable to any one culture at one point of time, and then what happens to the heroes who are no longer in fashion? What happens when a hero is rewritten to be something for for modern times, what happens to the old hero? Th that's part of the conceit over here, where they're not actually the same person and they exist in parallel, whether it's, you know, a metaverse or a multiverse. I'm not sure if those kind of scientific things apply over here. But as, as with Tom Strong, the Supreme is great fun to read, and it's particularly fun for readers of incontinuity superhero comics. Supreme seems to be very uh, directly a Superman analog, uh, which you also have in Astro City, and there's 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 some sort of a, a similarity between the Samaritan from Astro City, for example, and Supreme, because they are working off of those archetypes. But it's not it's not it's not purely a one-on-one -on -one correlation. But unlike Astro City, um, I think Supreme is a much more metafictional text because it does become about the way a lot of Alan Moore stories like League of Extraordinary Gentlemen become. It does become about storytelling and it does become about how we tell stories and what those stories mean. And Supreme, Supreme The Return, Supreme Story of the Year, both of these series were were superb in my opinion. I loved them when I first read them and borrowed them from a friend, but I couldn't find the trades anywhere. So I ended up getting them all in single issues and there's a whole bunch of them. So it was a nice long uh, meaty run, uh, both of the series put together and some of the most fun I've had at a winking metafictional superhero stuff, of which of course Alan Moore is a master, but sometimes it can be not that enjoyable and sometimes it's very enjoyable i'd put this into the very enjoyable category and also smart and but it doesn't hit you over the head with its smartness and prefers the story to have that sense of fun the sense of wonder the sense of uh, g whiz stuff that we love in superhero comics while doing this serious deconstruction of storytelling. Very unique, very interesting, and definitely one of those things that I wish would see some sort of a, a reprint. It's, it's you know, I, I would like to have collected editions of this so I can read it all without having to get to as many issues as I do, but I'm glad to have it. But I would like other people to read it. So just like Astro City, it's a good story that I wish more people would get to read. Um, and I hope that can happen one day. But until then, look for the singles if you haven't found them, because Supreme is really, it's sort of a hidden gem uh, as far as I'm concerned. All right. Um, all right. So I've lost count of how many I have on the list, but I'm, I'm just going to keep moving. 
I do have a whole bunch of honorable mentions, but I will I'll maybe save them for a I'll maybe save them for a little later. Um, get to things that aren't uh, aren't honorable mentions still. Okay, so next up on my list. Now here's an interesting thing. I've got two I've got two books over here, and they sort of signify the opposite ends. Sorry, I'm just going to be a little bit more chaotic. Okay. Okay, where's the last one? There we go. All right, so over here, I have powers. Now, the funny thing is this, uh, this volume of powers is printed, it's published by Icon, which is an imprint, a short-lived, maybe not that short-lived, imprint of Marvel Comics. But Powers is originally an image comic. And the first series, or maybe the first two series, were at Image before it moved um, uh, to create her own title, but before it moved to Icon over at Marvel. And I love it. I think it's great. Um, Brian Michael Bendis has done some stuff that I've really enjoyed. I've really enjoyed Ultimate Spider-Man, and I was just in the right place, right time to really enjoy Ultimate Spider-Man. But Powers is... I think an earlier work. I think it's his first work with superheroes. He was writing crime uh, comics, uh, and this is a police procedural about the police. And unlike Alan Moore's Top Ten, which is funny because they were worried when they heard that Alan Moore is working on a superhero police procedural thing as well, Alan Moore's Top Ten is about cops in a city full of superheroes where everyone, well, not superheroes, but superpowered people, and everyone has superpowers. And who would the police be? So the police are also superpowered. The police over here are not superpowered. They're investigating crimes that have to deal with superpowers. And the interesting, well, there are many interesting things about it, but the first interesting thing that struck me about this is the art style seemed very classic. You know, it seemed like the animated show art style, Bruce Tim art style. Also, going back further, the dark shadows of uh, Matsukeli, uh, Alex Toth. You can see all those influences in there, but this style makes it look really um, kid-friendly. It makes it look like the animated show or something like that. It makes it look very clean and accessible. And the story is quite graphic. It's quite violent. Uh, there's not just violence on the pages, but there's insinuation of extreme violence. So that's the first thing that uh, that struck me, the, the conflict or the contrast between that art style and then what the content of the story is. It's law and order, special victims with superpowers. And it's a very interesting story. And I know that now there might be a number of superhero police procedurals out there, or maybe there aren't, I don't know. But the couple that I have read, Gotham Central is uh, uh, another one, um, top 10, of course. I've I, I may have a soft spot for that particular subgenre, but Powers is a great comic uh, or, you know, an early work or relatively early work by someone who's really trying out new things and has got a lot of really clever ideas. Uh, and the writer and the artist are a very good match. And I know that Powers continues. I've not really read beyond the first two, I think the three, I think it's two series. It's, it's whatever's in five of these deluxe editions. That's the only powers I've ever read, and this is the only edition I've been able to find powers in. But I did, I did uh, note that even though these copies are from Icon, this is an image series. So I'll put, I'll put powers on my top ten image comics list, uh, unless unless you feel that it doesn't qualify, which would be the case. Um, and this is the other way around, kind of. It would be the case with Criminal, which is now uh, with Image and being published by Image, but uh, was originally an icon 
book. So it's just the other way around from Powers. It's something that was with Icon, which is also creator-owned. Um, but I love Criminal. This might be my favorite of the Ed Brubaker, Sean Phillips uh, collaborations. Although, as I will note, I haven't read all of them. I haven't read many of them, actually. So Criminal would probably have made my list if it had been an image comic, but it isn't. Um, so it doesn't make my list. Brubaker and Phillips do have other image comics together. So there's Sleeper, which was, I think, the first of their collaborations I read, um, coming from the Wildstorm imprint, but that's fine. You know, Astro City was Wildstorm, and I'm counting Wildstorm. So Sleeper is good, is, is pretty good. Fatal is one that I have to think really closely about. This takes their signature crime, but... There's another angle to it usually, and in this case, it's horror, Lovecraftian horror underneath, and it's it's quite interesting. There's some people out there who don't like Fatal, and I think if that's true, if most people don't like it, I think it's underrated. Um, but I got the sense that maybe maybe most people are like me and they think it's pretty good. I, I I'd still pick Criminal uh, over Fatal, but. That doesn't mean it's not good. So as I said, there'll be some titles that don't make my list. Sleeper and Fatal don't make my list. Um, but that doesn't mean they're not worthwhile. That doesn't mean they're not worthy of reading. It's just stuff on my list is pretty good. And I love it more. So I don't think for either of these books, I would be able to say, I love these books. Whereas I can say that about Astro City. I can say that about the Max. I can say I love them, even if I don't understand everything, even if I don't get everything, even if I don't love every single chapter when I think about that comic as a whole, uh, Supreme. Um, even Saga, I feel affection. Uh, you know, I feel this kind of warmth towards these comics. So I think some of that is, is, is just a little short uh, for these two books. And that's unfortunate because I really like Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips as collaborators. I have really enjoyed that. They're kind of the, they're going to have a lot of silver medals, uh, but never the gold type of thing. Because there's just something that they're going to make all the top 20s, but they're just not going to get into the, oh, I love this. Absolutely love this. Um, I will take the opportunity here to say... Um, all right, and I think this is a good time to talk about certain kinds of comics. Uh, these are the comics that I have not read, um, but I'm interested in reading. So the reason why I'm getting to this here is because Velvet is also uh, Brubaker Phillips, as is, as is, oh, I think I had another one. Where did it go? Did I? Oh, the Fade Out. Right, there we go. So The Fade Out, I have not read. Velvet, I have not read. I have heard very good things about both Velvet and The Fade Out. So maybe those will be the ones that make the list since Criminal Kant and Fatal and uh, uh, what's the other one I was talking about right now? Sleeper. Uh, since they are not making it, maybe it'll be Velvet, maybe it'll be uh, The Fade Out. Um, I don't know. But because I haven't read them, I can't put them on this list. Fatal did... did come close but you know there was contention but i'll also say that here's a here's a very short list a very short list of titles i haven't read but i'm extremely intrigued by uh, especially because of the recommendations and glowing uh, praise given by viewers of this channel and friends of mine and people online um the black monday murders haven't read it i would be interested in reading it extremity same thing. I haven't read it. The Fade Out, I already talked about. Flaming Carrot comics. Now, I've heard a lot about Bob Burden, Flaming Carrot. I think it's Bob Burden. But I didn't know that Flaming Carrot was image comics. But apparently it is. And I'm very intrigued because whenever I've heard people talk about Flaming Carrot, they've talked about it with great gusto. You know, so I it's... For me, uh, it's less important how many people are talking about something and more about how they're talking about it. And sometimes it's like there are only two people who I've heard mention this, but the way they mentioned it and the way they talked about it, the way they praised it got my attention more than, you know, a 
100 people talking about it. Not to say that I'm immune to, you know, a mass kind of thing, but I'm always intrigued in a particularly passionate way of uh, saying this, you've got to read this and why they say that. And Flaming Carrot is one of those things. It's like not a lot of people talk about it, but when people do or the people who do, they talk about it very highly. So I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued. Um, I hate Fairyland. I Hate Fairyland is something now that I've seen on a couple of people's best image lists. And I am a fan of Scotty Young, particularly of the Oz books that he did with Eric Schanauer. Uh, so it sounds like silly fun. I mean, I don't expect that it's going to be a revelatory, life-changing comic, but it looks so much fun and it sounds like so much fun and the art looks so zany and crazy and it's something that I already know that I will lean towards. So that's that's one of the ones that I uh, want to read. Kill or Be Killed. Uh, it kind of swept that uh, other video I was talking about. Everyone was talking about Kill or Be Killed. So now I have to, I have to check it out. There are books uh, by some of these creators that I've read that I haven't loved as much as other people have loved. And I'll talk a little bit about them in the big list of honorable mentions I've got coming up. Um, but I'm always willing to try new things by the same people uh, until they burn me like four or five times. I, I have pretty thick skin and I've seen some people create masterpieces and absolute garbage uh, right next to each other. So I'm never really going to hold one thing against someone. But if they burn me five or six times, I'm I'm eventually going to get to the point where I think that person's not for me. But having said that, I find it very difficult to think of who I think of that way. Who is it that I will never read because I've just read too much bad stuff by them? I really can't think of anybody that I've blocked out completely. Um, at least I can't think of anybody like that right now. So, Kill or Be Killed. Uh, Orc Stain, that sounded really interesting to me. Uh, Ascender. Uh, Blue in Green is a graphic novel that I want to get to because I've seen pages from it and I thought it was a really good idea. And when I saw the pages from it and read a couple of pages, I was very intrigued. Now, it could go either way, but right now I'm intrigued and I want to read that. And uh, Deadly Class, that's another one that I keep hearing about. Um, I don't know if I had an incorrect idea about it at some point of time. I, I, I don't know if I thought it was a battle royale thing or somebody gave me the wrong idea for it. But recently I heard... People talking about it and talking about it uh, with a lot of high praise, and I thought maybe I need to reevaluate that. So those are the those are the that's a short list of what I think is out there by image that I'm intrigued by and that I definitely want to take um, a look at. All right, um, all right. So what do we got? What do we have in the comments over here? Uh, Kill or be killed and pulp. Yes, pulp is another one that I haven't uh, I haven't read yet. Uh, Black Monday murders. Good, good, good. So I'm I'm glad to see people over here supporting uh, the the list that I have as far as as was what I'm enthusiastic about. All right, where was I? What was I doing? Oh. Oh, I'm, I keep opening this work document, but I don't want to close it because then I won't remember to open it tomorrow morning, which is Monday. Uh, okay, so we talked about powers. We talked about uh, criminal sleeper fatal. Let's see what 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 do we have over here? I have all right. This is uh, this is a comic that I think is from the middle period of image or from when a certain kind of revitalization happens. So I think, again, this is very, I'm not a scholar or a historian, but I think at the beginning image was these different imprints and maybe each imprint was trying to have its own universe, but then it sort of switched and it switched to instead of Jim Lee's got his imprint with his universe and Rob Liefeld's got his and Eric Larson's got his, they also started bringing in other people and their creator-owned work. And at the beginning, it was done a particular way. And of course, you've got um, things like uh, some of the ones that we've already talked about. 
But then it really changed when that contract with the creators became 100% yours. Image only takes um, administrative fees. And so therefore, moving away, maybe not, but as far as I know, it's not so much about an image universe and image heroes, uh, like say the Valiant universe or something like that. It's not that. It's completely creator-owned pieces. And I think that started a second wave of popularity. So Image was extremely popular when it started, and then its popularity and sales dipped, and then Dark Horse and IDW started climbing as an option, you know, as a as, as a choice uh, from Marvel and DC, um, threatening Image's place as, as, as the big, the next big one after those two. And then Image came back with a sort of resurgence. And there are a number of titles of that resurgence. I think this might be from 2012 or 2013, um, maybe earlier, I'm not sure, Lazarus by uh, Greg Rucker and Michael Lark. And I read this right at the time, I think it was coming out or immediately after. And I read a lot of image comics of various kinds, but this one, this one got my attention. This felt just up my alley, even though uh, it's, it's, it's sci-fi cyberpunk future in which gangster families, our corporation families, rule everything and it's about the interfamily war and uh, I, I i really don't want to spoil too much of it but that setup is a pretty prevalent setup for the whole series and it's not a very big series it's just two volumes i, I don't know if there have been spin-offs or continuation of lazarus but i thought this was a great time it was serious and it was fun it was action-packed the artwork in it was Really good. Again, I like artwork that gets the point across and is stylish without being show-offish for certain kinds of stories. Uh, stories that are propelled by their narrative, uh, stories that are propelled by their character beats and interactions. And I had, I, I found all of those things very satisfying. Now, I haven't read Lazarus in a decade. So, I don't know if it will hold up. I did wonder for this video if I should start uh, rereading stuff, but then with the number of books I ended up, I thought that was impractical. But this one was one of the ones that I was tempted to. I was like, should I go back into this, take a look at this and see if it's still, because, you know, in the interim, there are many other things that you've read. But I think, I think it still holds up. My memories of this are pretty solid. I liked... I liked what I read uh, a lot. And then when looking through the list of other things that were published around that time, before and after it, I still kept coming back to this story. I still remembered the story, but I also remembered how cool it was. And uh, I'm going to keep it on the list for right now, unless something comes along and knocks it, knocks it off. Um, I will now take this opportunity to talk about a whole stack of comics, a whole stack of comics that I have over here that are all honorable mentions of um, some kind or the other. And I've, I've got I've got a lot of them, but these are the ones that aren't um, that aren't going to be on the top ten. But I did want to I did want to mention I did want to mention them because I didn't realize some of you know I, when looking through the list of image comics I had forgotten that some of them were image. I'd forgotten that some of them existed. <laughs> but I also realized that I have a number of these and I have read them, again, maybe not for a long time. Maybe I never went past volume one. Maybe one volume was all there was to it. Um, but but there was, there was this thing of where I was reading Vertigo comics. And then after that, I was reading a bunch of like new image comics, volume ones. Now, I, I'm not saying that those Vertigo titles and those image titles were published at the same time, but my reading of it, maybe I was late coming to the Vertigo or maybe I was uh, just in time for the image. So to me, that was a good, a good uh, sampling of unique stories that don't have to be oriented on 
continuity um, that you can you can have things of consequence happen to the characters because you're not worried about again continuity or other s- series that depend on it and things like that. And I tried a lot of different things, and some of them were good, and some of them were less good. Um, let me see. I'm going to start with a handful of titles that had potential, I would say, and are still worth reading to some extent, but really didn't do it for me. Five Ghosts was one of them. Um, the The lead over here is able to manifest one of five different historical figures, including Rasputin. You know, it's one of those things where, okay, it's an interesting idea, but it could be really crap or it could be fantastic. It all depends on the execution. I was, I picked this up because I was intrigued by that. Oh, yeah, Sherlock Holmes, Dracula. And it's kind of like one of those video games, you know, where you can swap out uh, who you're playing in order to do a particular level. There's been a whole bunch of those kind of things. I mean, in Mario, depending on the suits, but Killer7 and stuff like that. So... Unfortunately, I didn't find this to rise to the potential of that idea. It's still interesting. It's still fun. And maybe someone will tell me that I'm wrong about it. And it's actually a fantastic comic. Uh, again, I've only read this once, but it didn't it didn't capture me in that way. Um, again, uh, this is not to <laughs> say anything about these comics themselves. This is more about my tastes or what I latched on to. Uh, another example is Pretty Deadly, which a lot of people talked fantastically about. And they said it was a great comic and it's got horror, fantasy, world building. But it didn't it didn't catch my imagination in the same way. There's no doubt about the talent involved in Pretty Deadly. But... It wasn't it wasn't to my liking, um, at least at the time that I read it. This one, um <laughs> this one really hurts me because it's the Autumn Lands by Kurt Busiek and Benjamin Dewey, who later I uh, read uh, in Beasts of Burden, uh, who's who's done a couple of Beasts of Burden stories now. Uh the Autumn Lands was something I had really high expectations of. And it's not like I hated it or disliked. It just, again, it didn't work for me. And this is one that I couldn't understand why. It's written by Kurt Busiek. It is high fantasy. It's sword and sorcery. And it's set in a different world with all different kinds of relationships. Why wouldn't this be terrific? As a fan of... um, as a fan of Busiek in particular, I I I was ready to love this. And I didn't love it. Now, in the years since, I've actually heard a couple of people say this is a really good comic. So I do have this, like, should I reread this? Should I should I go back to the Autumn Lands? And because, because I'm still, I'm still a little <laughs> irritated at not liking it more. And like, what's wrong with me? I, I really should, I should give it another shot but there's lots to read and some at some point of time you've got to trust uh, you've got to trust your instincts uh two comics that i did enjoy uh, but won't make my top 10 because i didn't love them but i did think they were interesting were redlands and bitch planet now in 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 all of these cases i think what happens with these comics and the way i judge them the way i was saying right at the beginning of the live stream the way I judge them is, did I seek out other volumes? Did I f- want to find out more if there is more? And in some cases, it's not necessarily uh, because it was bad. You might just think, oh, that's all there was. And that was a perfectly fine story. And it had nice closure. And that's it. So there might be a volume two out there. But I don't know because volume one was good. And in some cases, you might know that there is a volume two out there. Or it's quite possible. And you could look it up. But if you don't get moved uh, to do that, then something is, you know, something's not quite right. Because there will be cases. And I'm not the kind of person who buys seven volumes of something because they've decided to read it. I go volume by volume, unless I'm getting a special reprint of something that I know that I enjoy. And that does have its problems. You could get to volume two and then volume three is out of stock and now you can't get your hands on it. And that happens to me all the time. But... I, I 
I I don't I don't buy everything in one go. I I allow uh, <laughs> the reading and the availability, of course. But I allow the reading to determine how I go, and I like that. When I look at my shelves, and I'm like, oh yeah, that one was interesting up to volume three, and then I gave up. And oh look, there I went all the way to eight because it kept going. It's sort of a report card on the series from my personal view. Um. You know, when you look at the shelves, you're like, that's how much I like that. And then you get to something like Bourne, and you're like, all right, this entire shelf is Bourne in various editions. So I guess you really liked Bourne. So the the things that unite all of these are that I never went for a volume two. They may not have a volume two. It may not have been available, uh, I looked. But in the time since then, I haven't gone looking for more. And some of them I didn't like when I first read them. Some of them I liked a little bit. Some of them I liked all right. But they are united by the fact that they were never followed up on, um, which includes Monstrous. And this is probably the big one because this, this was a smash hit. Everybody loved it. And it really does have a lot to recommend, um, including some spectacular artwork. But I wasn't completely captivated by the storytelling outside of the gorgeousness of the art, which is spectacular but it's just not enough and um, I found myself a little confused and it's not that I think I'm a very smart person but I generally don't have a problem following things it, then I realized it's not because it's complicated or because the characters it's just because I'm not caring enough a lot is being told to me and a lot is being given to me in this kind of narrative which is supposed to have significance but I'm not getting it myself again a personal point of view but I think that's a big one for most people. For a lot of people, Monstrous might even be their number one image comic of all time. It's, it's, it's won all the awards. It's, it's gotten huge sales. My opinion isn't really going to make a difference to its reputation. It's just, for me, it's interesting sometimes to line up uh, what people have said is fantastic and, uh, and how you feel about it. And that's kind of the way I also felt about Low. Um, although it's been longer, Monstrous is a relatively more recent read in the last couple of years. I'd say Low is a little bef before that. Uh, maybe I'm getting it mixed up. But interesting stuff, but not captivating, not interesting enough. It is something that, you know, and the, there's another thing is that sometimes I will have trade paperbacks and then I like it. Not only will I continue, but I'll sort of upgrade to a nicer hardcover edition it's not necessary and you're going to enjoy the story in trade paperbacks just fine. But again, because I do have that weakness and I do do that and then I'll either give away the trade paperbacks or sell them or trade them or something like that if I can. And the, when I don't do that, that's also kind of an indication. Sometimes it's just because something doesn't exist. I have many, many books that I absolutely love and it's fine. That's the edition they're in and that's the edition I'll keep. Um, but Sometimes opportunities have come up to say, hey, do you want like the monstrous Barnes & Noble deluxe with this little like for this $25 price? And it's tempting because you know it's $50 or what have you. And I'm just like, no, I'm I'm fine. Thank you. You know, do you want the low deluxe edition oversized at this bargain price? I'm like, uh, I'm tempted because of the, you know, bargain and because it's hardcover, but why would I do that if I didn't enjoy that? So those are also indicators for me that something wasn't, you know, 100, uh, 100%. Uh, the most recent one, I think, is God Country, which I'd heard a lot of stuff about, uh, a lot of good stuff about. I don't read, uh, as, as, as those of you who follow this channel know, I don't read in continuity superhero comics, so I don't know much about... Uh, Donny Cates' superhero stuff. I keep hearing about it from friends who do. Um, but they were like, hey, this is not a superhero story. This is not in continuity. It's a standalone volume. It's superb. You should read it. I read it. It's okay. I mean, I liked parts of it. I like parts of it quite a lot, actually. Some of the character moments, some of the interactions, uh, the artwork in it is is generally very, very good. But the rest of it didn't didn't capture my imagination and 
although I know it's a little bit of a cheap thing, at some point of time, it always ends up being, you know, someone with a blue beam fighting someone with a purple beam. And that happens with a lot of things that are my favorite as well. But sometimes I kind of want to know what those things are. And I want to know what this means other than just like, I have energy, you have energy, your energy is taking my energy away until my energy is taking yours away. I don't mean to be facetious, but it does it does bother me sometimes in in action sequences and cosmic fights and things like that, where there is no other consequence other than the fact that this is energy and they're fighting. I mean, it might as well be a chess game, but it just doesn't look that bright and flashy. And and some of my issues with God Country eventually came down to the climax being more of that, whereas the setup had seemed kind of interesting and different from that. So maybe it was my own let down at my own expectations. Um, what else do I have? What else do I have? All right, so these are the ones that didn't really do all that much for me, even though they all had potential, even though they all had things in uh, in them that I that I enjoyed. Um, they as as a whole, it didn't become a cohesive a cohesive um, triumph. Now I do want to talk about. Should I do more honorable mentions or should I try to get another thing on my list? What do else what do I have on my list? Ah, there we go. Um, all right. Oh, I've got some good comments over here. Um, Autumn Lands is never finished, but it's good. All right, I I'm gonna take a look at this because I, as I said, I do I do want to take a look at this one more time. I think I might have missed something. Um, yeah, all right. So people are saying Autumn Lands is good. Uh, Benjamin Dubiar, check out Mystery Index on Tumblr. All right, I will. Uh, Rich Tommaso has done some good stuff for Image. All right. Uh, Oh, wait a minute. Spy Seal is also Image, isn't it? I, well, all right. Spy Seal is a great comic. I don't know if it makes my top 10, but if that's Image and they did it in the, I guess I didn't have it on my Image shelf because I must have put it with my Tintins uh, because it's in that format size. All right. Thank you for reminding me of Rich Tomaso's Spy Seal. Um, okay, great, 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 great. All right. Let's go to another one from my list. What has made my list if all of these things haven't? Now, oh, wait, I will, I will, in order to talk about the next one on my list, I do want to talk about one more um, honorable mention. And the reason why is because as I said, the image comics we've been talking about, and in general, when people think about image, they think about sensational stuff. They talk about um, uh, speculative fiction, but really bombastic, really broad in some ways, and uh, not not your mainstream kind of, uh, well, anyway, not mainstream. But the other thing about image, I think it comes across as, a, as an adult publisher. Yeah. You've got books that are not meant for kids, and they all seem to sort of revel in the fact that they're not made for kids. They 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 want to celebrate the fact that comics are not just for children and they shouldn't be infantilized. And even their um, view of maybe Marvel and DC might be that they're still infantile. That's the way a lot of the creators seem to be because you have a number of creators, particularly in that second wave uh, that I was talking about, who actually did work with Image for self-creator-owned properties who were Marvel and DC superstars. So they also gave this impression, or at least readers like me got the impression, that that stuff they have to do for a paycheck, this is stuff they really want to do. Or if they were allowed to, these are the kind of things we might see over there. And you've, you, you know, you've got Matt Fraction, you've got uh, Jonathan Hickman, you've got uh, a number of people who, who were doing both things at the same time. And you can't help but compare one to the other because they're coming from the same creators. But it did come across it does come across as an adult publisher, as a, um, um, as a, 
this is not for kids stuff. So I I was interested in does image have a lot of not a lot of does image have all ages stories and yes they do and I was trying to figure out which ones from my shelves and I did come across this that I haven't read in a while uh, which is Josh Howard's Dead at 17 and this is a sort of uh, ultimate edition so it puts the whole series together although I'm sure that there might be spin-offs and things like that and again you've seen the art of uh, Powers Eming's art and this is very reminiscent of that this is sort of a young adult teen drama, but with death and resurrection, not zombies. And I know that that sort of thing is also more popular these days. I think this is a little older. Um, I'm, I'm not sure which year this is from, but this is a comic that I enjoyed. I didn't love it, but I thought it was interesting and I thought it was tongue in cheek and I thought it was funny. But I think at the end of the day, maybe from what I'm remembering of uh, Dead at 17, maybe it was a little too teeny. Uh, I, I don't want to say that if that's not true, but maybe it didn't it didn't cross something. And I don't mean that it has to be um, again, a deconstruction or a spoof or something like that. It just didn't become something truly all ages. And it seemed to be for a particular group, for a particular age group, which anyway is not my favorite way of writing a story. I don't think everything needs to have sex and violence in it. Of course, I love all ages comics and I make videos on all ages comics quite often. But but this one was good. And I, I, I would be interested if anyone has ever read this of what their opinion is, or am I misremembering it? Um, but it but it didn't quite make my list, but I did think it was worth noting for being something that isn't necessarily explicitly adult, which a lot of image uh, might seem to be. And again, not necessarily because of uh, sex and language and things like that, but also extremely heady concepts and uh, uh, philosophical uh, things that may not be appealing to uh, younger readers. Again, not really younger readers. I wouldn't say this is, you know, for eight-year-olds or nine-year-olds, but there's nothing, uh, there's death and there's, there's that. But, you know, they're dead at 17, but they're back to life. So it's an interesting thing worth noting. But I did realize that one of my recent reads of Image um, that I've really enjoyed is indeed an all-ages work. And I owe it to a friend of the channel's viewer who sent it to me all the way from the United States is Leave It to Chance, which is a perfectly charming read, which is a great adventure storytelling involving magic and sorcery. Um, it's written by James Robinson, drawn by uh, Paul Smith, and Jeremy Cox. And I've not read much of James Robinson. I've been looking for Starman, obviously, because everyone says you've got to read Starman. And I think there was another uh, Airboy, uh, kind of a meta textual sort of comic. Those are ones that I have not read. I've read that Hellboy, Batman, Starman crossover comic. I've read a couple of his other um, comics. I've read some superhero stuff that he did. I think uh, the Justice League, JLA Golden Age is something someone recommended to me and I read that. But this is great stuff. This is a great comic. And do not be put off by the fact that it's all ages. It is charming and it is funny. It is wonderfully drawn. It the the world that it imagines, the rules that it makes up are are solid. <laughs> they're, they're perfectly fine. And the kind of things that the characters deal with, the lead character in particular, are absolutely relatable. Uh, she's very likable. You do get a little irritated but the way that you would at some impulsive teenager uh, headed off uh, you know, to, to jump into trouble and uh, with her little pet dragon. And this is a terrific series that I had never heard of. And then it became almost an instant favorite when I started reading it. Uh, I'm glad to have the whole series. I think 
there are three hardcover volumes and then one uh, special prestige format issue that finishes the story. I'm not sure if there are uh, spin-offs or follow-ups to this, or but I'm just talking about this series from Image, the, the first series from Image. And I was sent by, by DB, I was sent the first hardcover and the entire series in singles. Um, it's a superb, superb series for those of you who may find these uh, uh, available. I would highly recommend it. And if you're not interested, but if you know uh, kids, if you have kids, uh, if you if you know people who would be interested in it, I liked it. I really liked it. And I'm glad that at least one of the comics on my list is something that is all ages and um, and can be read. Um, so... So that's so that's that's on my list. I'm I'm putting I'm putting uh, leave it to chance on my list of top ten image comics. Have I crossed ten already? I don't know. Uh, we'll we'll find out. But you know, it could be, it could be um, upset depending on how strong a showing others make of it. All right. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about some other honorable mentions that don't quite make it but were close or at least played a major part and now i've got a whole bunch of them so i'm going to go through them fast chu uh i think is a very successful comic and was very popular i really enjoyed it i thought it was funny i thought it was imaginative i thought it was clever i didn't love all of it uh, but there were things that were very adroit in its writing and I think if it had not had um, a larger seriousness come into the story, if it had just continued to be jokey, 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 I think it would have sort of run out of steam. But I think the amplification of the stakes and the twists in the storyline that really mattered uh, to you as the reader, but to the characters, I think they were pushed up properly or they were pushed up well and that's one of the things that made it uh, good over a period of time still there were other things that i didn't i didn't completely love about it uh, but there was a lot to enjoy and it is very funny there's a character over here poyo the the demon chicken poyo and apparently poyo is a big fan favorite and i was not really interested in the poyo sections of of the comic or i mean they were funny you know first then you see this other thing you see this other thing and it comes it keeps happening and then the joke kind of wears thin but then something happened with poyo that i was like wow that was that was pretty cool and now all of this other stuff that i thought was um uh, wearing thin, all of this other stuff that I wasn't, ha you know, didn't have a lot of patience for. It kind of makes sense. Now they all kind of have a reason. So it's moments like that that made me go, it's not just a joke book. It's really smartly written. It's very charmingly drawn. The The art style is something that I still, I still enjoy. Um, and I know that a lot of people love this with very good reason. So it was kind of there. It was it was knocking on the door, but uh, didn't quite make it. Um, Savage Town by Declan Shalvey, but Declan Shalvey as the writer. The artist over here is Philip Barrett. This is not a comic that I have heard many people talking about, and it's a it's an Irish gangster story, set in Ireland, done in color that I thought was quite good. It felt authentic and it felt uh, raw. Uh, it felt well observed and it didn't have, you know, an overabundance of flash, which I think worked really well for the crime story it was telling. It is, um, it is a little low key when you want it to be high key. And then the high key moments that I think are, are pretty good. Uh, but if there was more of this, I would read it. This is one of those things where I don't think, I think this is just the whole story. But if Declan Shalvey and Philip Barrett wanted to return, I would I would definitely pick this up. And it's an unusual setting, at least for me. I don't read a lot of comics set in that milieu and in that area. So just for that alone, I think it's, it's, it's worth a look um, uh, for anyone interested. Um... All right, let's see what else we got over here. Oh, some of these big ones that uh, that that came 
around the same time and together that almost uh, made this list. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's an almost, I don't know. Manhattan Project. This is uh, madcap stuff. Imagining the scientists of uh, the Manhattan Project as using the Manhattan Project as just a cover in order to do all kinds of bizarre science experiments. You've never seen Feynman like this. You've never seen Einstein like this. You've never seen Oppenheimer like this. It's a it's it's ridiculous. It's difficult. <laughs> it's difficult to describe the lunacy of this comic. And the other thing is, um, I think I read the whole thing in trade paperbacks. So six volumes, I think there were. I bought each one of the six volumes and read it. So it's not <laughs> like I wanted to know more about it. I wanted to read on. Once you finish the whole thing, or I suspect, you know, and, and when I was reading this, I had to wait for the next trade paperback to come out. So it wasn't like I was reading them back to back. I would read the first trade paperback, then I would have to wait for some months, then the next trade paperback would come out, I'd buy it. So it spread over a period of time of me buying the trades. And I think that helps. I think if you try to read it all together, I think I would, I would, I would run out of energy at some point of time in the third book. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to get to the end in one go. It's also something that once you finished it, you might look back on it and say, mm, that was, you know, that was, uh, it's, it's kind of like chew because it's a lot of fun to read. It's, it's very uh, engaging when you're dealing with it. Uh, but does it really echo with greater uh, power after you're done reading? Mm, I don't know. Uh, I'm not saying that everything has to, but I think when I'm making a top 10, I'm thinking about all of these things. I can't think about only something that if even funny stuff, even slapstick funny stuff can have a resonance. It just depends on how it's done. So this is one of those things where I'm just like, this could have made the top 10, but it just doesn't resonate later. But it's still a lot of fun to read. It is a roller coaster, and it's it's very unusual, and that's one of the things that I'd say about most of the comics here, whether or not you agree with my opinion. Or, uh, they're all worth taking a look at because they all have so many different ideas and so many different things that could go uh, anyway. Um, but uh, I, I, I think this is definitely something people should look into if you haven't looked at it already. Um, also from Hickman was East of West, which I bought two trades of. So I, I, I was very intrigued by this Western fantasy set in this kind of expansive world with complex uh, relationships between the tribes who inhabit it and the, the kind of quest for power that lies at the center of all of this stuff. Wonderful art, very deep, thinking uh, again i use the term word building world building uh, as a sort of shorthand but somewhere after the second book or somewhere in the middle of the second book i kind of lost the uh, i lost the plot <laughs> I, I don't mean the literal plot i i just found myself not as engaged with it anymore even though i thought the ideas and the conceptualization was terrific but I wasn't feeling this urge to continue. But I also think that I looked for volume three and I couldn't find volume three and then I kind of forgot about it. So this is one of those things that, yes, the only two volumes on my shelf, but I suspect it could have been closer to, um, you know, something like the Manhattan Projects. I could have had more of this if something hadn't created a break in the supply chain at that point of time. But both East of uh, East of West and Manhattan Projects were later available in these large deluxe oversized editions that, uh, that Image uh, brings out. And I kind of uh, skipped uh, getting them in those editions. So again, that tells me something about whether I really loved something or not. Um, what else do I have? What else do I have? Oh my goodness, I'm wasting a lot of time. All right, we've got over here, Alex and Ada, which also kind of, maybe I just associated with all this because they have white covers. Alex and Ada was something I really enjoyed. And uh, this isn't a very long series. I believe it's just three um, trade paperbacks. Oh, oh, is it four? I don't remember now. It's not that long at all. And this one, like when you think about East of West, 
and Manhattan Projects, uh, some of these other comics that we've looked at, this is kind of a, it doesn't seem as heavy a hitter as all of those. But interestingly, this one appealed to me the most. This one had emotional resonance and even the art, which I've heard some people criticize as being uh, flat or unexpressive, I thought it was very expressive. And I thought it worked really well for the story of this AI and this relationship between this guy and this girl, the girl being an android, uh, the robot. And it has shades. I like stories about artificial intelligence. Uh, I like stories that examine, you know, what's the boundary between artificial intelligence and human intelligence and does it matter? I've loved stuff like that in comics like Pluto and stuff like Battlestar Galactica and Blade Runner. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's my soft spot. Um, and this reminds me of those kind of things, but also the Spike Jones movie, Her, uh, artificial intelligence and romance and love and stuff like that. It's, it, it has the tendency, it has the ability to be really creepy if you think about it and feel really odd. And when these stories sort of embrace that and run with that creepiness factor and start examining that, it pushes me out of my comfort zone as far as what I'm thinking about romance and love. And I like that kind of challenge. So even though it's not as heavy a hitter as Jonathan Hickman and Alex and Ada was actually something that, um, that I really enjoyed, and uh, uh, the artwork and the writing uh, worked really well together. And this, this I think, had a closer shot of making my top 10, but still doesn't. Um, because of how much I enjoyed Alex and Ada, I picked up something else by the Luna Brothers. Uh, this is Girls. I don't remember if Girls was published before Alex and Ada or after. I think it was after. And uh, this was a surprise to me. I was not expecting this one to be as appealing as it was. It's got some weird ideas in it, but again, it's the it's the character interplay and the situation they're in. There are some similarities to other things in pop culture, television shows, but I don't want to mention those things because then it'll sort of spoil it if you take a look. But Girls is... The reason I'm talking about it is because it was a surprise. I really was not expecting this to be as affecting as it was. And again, it's not a very long series. I believe it's two or three of these thin trades. And um, all right, Aaron Abernathy tells me that Girls was prior. All right, good, good to know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the Luna Brothers uh, for with Alex and Ada and Girls, pretty impressive. I like it. Uh, the storytelling, the artwork, the plot, the dialogue, the characters, they work well. There is, there's, a, there's a scene in Alex and in Ada in which she, she, the robot, is sitting on the sofa and he tells a joke or something. And then it's just those repeated panels and then a smile on her face or she tries to laugh imitating him. It just works. It works very clearly, very simply and very elegantly in a way that I think a lot of the heavier, showier kind of things doesn't manage to communicate. So that's a little bit about how it worked for me and how I responded to that. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh my goodness, I've got more, more. Uh, Casanova by uh, Matt Fraction. Uh, Matt Fraction also has, oh, now I can't find it. He also has over here Sex Criminals. So Matt Fraction, Jonathan Hickman, they get like a couple of series that almost make it. Um, but Casanova, I picked up because of the art of Gabriel Ba. This is something that I picked up immediately after I had read Day Tripper because I was looking for anything else that Ba and Moon had done. And uh, this, was, this was very interesting, but eventually didn't move my heart, uh, but it was very clever and it was very smart and it's very stylish. And it, I, I just wanted a little bit more of that sort of pulpy stuff that it promised, um, stuff from newspaper comics like Garth and Modesty Blaze that I had read in my childhood, which this initially reminded me of mixing that together with James Bond. Um, it has so much potential 
but it felt just a little too cool, a little too removed uh, and not uh, grimy enough and not dirty enough and certainly not for lack of trying. It's very stylish art and it is very stylishly written, but not quite, not quite what I was looking for. Uh, Happy by Grant Morrison and Chris Robertson. Happy is uh, maybe an underrated Grant Morrison story. I really liked it. There's a lot of Grant Morrison that people love and I don't love as much. And there's a lot of stuff that people say is almost, they have almost a religious fervor about his brain and the kind of concepts he's coming up with. But this is a simple enough concept that is deceptive and I found this to be a very enjoyable comic. So Happy is also uh, close, but not uh, not quite on my list. Millar and Murphy's Chrononauts was an absolute blast. It was a very fun read. I think there's a volume two or there's continuing stories of this out. for, But for the longest, and I don't have that. For the longest time, um, this was uh, this was something that I'd heard about. I, then I found a copy. And... Honestly, Mark Millar for me is uh, kind of like Warren Ellis, a bit hit and miss. There are certain things that I really enjoy and there are certain things I don't enjoy at all. Um, uh, Image Comics, I think, uh, will also have published uh, Wanted. I think Wanted was Image. I'm not sure, but Kick-Ass was Image. I'm not a fan of Kick-Ass. I'm not a fan of Wanted. I didn't like those comics. I didn't really enjoy them. Um, I understand what they're doing. But this... I enjoyed this. This was a lot of fun, uh, but it wasn't just fun. I mean, there's there's a, there's a little bit of seriousness in it, but it's goofy seriousness. And what I really enjoyed about this time travel story, uh, alongside uh, you know uh, moving things along and crazy things happening and good artwork, what I enjoyed about it is what that there were consequences to the time travel and the consequences built up on the stories. It's not those kind of time travel larks like you go you time travel something happens then you come back and then oh it's it's all good or just a funny thing things change and the fact that things change and the fact that the more they try to do stuff with it the more things change was for something this small and slight i thought that was a pretty interesting twist to put in there and a pretty good way to go about the story it still feels a little flimsy it feels a little like they could have fleshed it out more, but I don't think that's what they were going for. They were really going for some sort of a galloping action sort of thing. And um, uh, yeah, worth reading, definitely. Also worth reading, Sleepless, which uh, again, not a lot of people talk about, but I read um, I read Rat Queens. I read, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember all these fantasy kind of image comics that I read that were getting a lot of press and a lot of people were talking about. And they were okay, but they didn't, they didn't appeal to me as much as Sleepless did. So this is another one of those things where I think its contemporaries or other things, its peers may have, or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I don't know. Maybe this was a big hit. Maybe this was beloved by people. Um, But as a fantasy story set in a fantasy world having to do with fantasy politics, I thought this one, this one was a sleeper. Um, and definitely, definitely worth checking out. I enjoyed Sleepless more than Monstrous, for example, although people would find that sacrilegious to say. It's just a personal thing. But this one, uh, the artwork, the world, the story in this world, what it happens to be about, all of this stuff. It's it's the kind of stuff that people talk about when they talk about fantasy storytelling done in a very, very nice package, I think. All right, what do we have over here? All right, three, three, oh no, no, no. There's one more over here. This is a series called Peter Panzerfaust, which I had never heard of before. And I just found this copy uh, on eBay or something when I was visiting my sister for a dollar or something ridiculous like that. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna pick it up. It's a, it's a hardcover, deluxe edition for a dollar, why not? And I honestly thought that it was going to be something pretty disposable and that's why it's being remaindered or why it's available at that price. This is a uh, sort of telling of the Peter Pan story as uh, the Lost Boys as Nazi um, resistors, resistance to the Nazi regime. And a lot of fun. I, I, I think the idea is a good idea. And I think the way it's executed over here is very interesting. I know that this series, 
uh, has multiple volumes. I've just never found, I don't think they did any other deluxe editions of this after the first one. And that might be one of the reasons is I was, I, I wanted to find volume two or volume three in the deluxe form and they weren't there and the trades aren't available here. So one other reason, uh, I, I wouldn't say this is a superb comic that will, should have been on my top 10, but this is worth reading again. Um, but I haven't read anything beyond this, the first two trades, I guess. And I think there are six or seven trades of them um, out there. So Peter Pan's of House was an interesting read. And I would, you know, if, if you guys, if any of you can get your hands on more, you can tell me if the story gets better or lives up to the first two. Um, what am I missing? I seem to be missing something, but now it's too late. I can't. All right. Never mind. Someone started, uh, someone says, Kikas started Icon. All right, good. So it wouldn't have classified anyway. Jupiter's Legacy. Yes, I like Jupiter's Legacy. I don't have it here. I thought I pulled it out, but I can't find it over here. I did enjoy Jupiter's Legacy. Um, and, and the Mark Miller, I think that is my favorite Mark Miller. An image is Starlight uh, with art by Goran Parlov. Just beautiful art. This is a beautiful comic, but this is also, and maybe this says something about me, this is also the most earnest and the softest and the gentlest uh, Mark Millar story uh, I've ever read. It's, uh, it's as if... Um, Flash Gordon got old or um, Adam Strange. He used to be a swashbuckler across space uh, and he was a hero from Earth. And then he came back to Earth, retired. Nobody remembers that he was this big hotshot. Nobody cares. And uh, he's an old man living by himself and one day he's visited by these guys who say we need your help in another planet in another dimension and then he tries to fit into his costume There's a little bit of mr incredible sort of thing over there it's just a delightful book the uh, it's optimistic it's cheery it's uh, heroic uh, you'll applaud you'll You'll, you'll thrill at his success. You'll despair if he's almost beaten. It's nice, classic, good old-fashioned storytelling. And it's old-fashioned in the best way, where it doesn't have to be snarky. And I will admit that I was reading about half of this, waiting for like, all right, now when is it going to get nasty? And when is it going to really subvert all of this and become this other thing? And it never did. It just stayed in that zone throughout. If there's one complaint I have about it is I wanted this to be more. So it kind of, does, it, it does this great setup and then there's this thing and it finishes and then the story is over. And I wanted everything to be paced the way the setup was paced. So for something this thin, there's just something a little, a little disbalanced. Uh, but, you know, it's kind of the best kind of criticism if you say, I wish there was more of it. I wanted more of it. So as a standalone story, I think it's good. Uh, I think it could really have benefited by being a little longer, but it doesn't matter. I think if you haven't read uh, Starlight uh, or if you don't think Mark Millar is to your taste, I would definitely, I would definitely recommend this. All right. Um, okay. Now let's see. I'm going to go back to my list now and, uh, and, and, and see what else we've got on, on my list. These are some honorable mentions and these are probably all my honorable mentions, but I might have some more. Uh, but let's say, okay, next is on my list. I talked, uh, I briefly mentioned when I was talking about I Hate Fairyland, uh, Scotty Young's collaboration with Eric Schanauer on the Oz books that they did with Marvel. And I think there's now an omnibus of all those books. Uh, but they came out as individual, like single issues, six issues, and then collected in a volume. And Eric Schanauer is someone, uh, I picked that up. I didn't know who Scotty Young was at that time. I picked that up because of Eric Schanauer and because of Eric Schanauer's Age of Bronze, which is his retelling of uh, the Trojan War. 
of the Iliad and maybe the Odyssey. We don't know because the series hasn't hasn't finished and it's been on sort of indefinite hiatus. But first of all, it's about the Iliad. So we know, I always say we know how that turned out and we know what the story is. We know which characters killed whom and all of that stuff. So it's one of those where, yes, I wish they would continue with this. I think there are five volumes out right now and they've just gotten to halfway through the war. But this starts at the very beginning and this is a retelling like few others, I would say, because in his crisp black and white art and characterization, the one thing that Eric Shanawood does is that he removes all of the gods as far as real existing gods in the story. Uh, they're only references. So people say, I'm descended from this person or this person blessed my mother and therefore, but it's all their stories. It's just them being pompous or claiming things, but you never see any of the gods, you never see them interfere, you never see them do anything, which is a really interesting choice because you think, oh, that's a very important part of the story. But what that does is it makes this into like a historical story. It makes it, and, and it's shown by the research in this where you've got incredible research on architecture, on clothes, on, on, on farming implements and things like that. But also, it is an amalgamation of every um, Iliad story there is. What that means is that Eric Schanauer is not only adapting Homer, but also Shakespeare and also anyone else who has written about these characters. If there's Troilus and Cressida, if there is this thing about Agamemnon, he's put it all into this story. So this is kind of, I mean, not really, but it's it's like... It's like Homer's Iliad grand design, <laughs> where, where he'll take things that have been written later and imagined as part of that and put them in chronologically. So this thing that uh, Shakespeare had written about is going to show up at the beginning of the story because that's when Shakespeare's story had said that this was going to be there. It's very unique. It's very clever. But most of all, it plays like a straight up historical epic in which you're talking about real people with jealousies and treaties and uh, uh, things that they're breaking and things that they're promising. And then uh, kind of a darker thing to things as well. So when you have the twins who were touched by God in the temple, well, that means a completely different thing with the priests at the temple and things like that. I mean, it's not very explicit, but it's there. So that kind of examination of epic and myth by saying that what if myth was just history and what if all these heroic characters and villains were all just people? Uh, superb, superb storytelling. I really think more people should give Age of Bronze a look and I really wish that Eric Schanauer would continue with this series. But as I said, even if he does it, the four or five volumes that we have are excellent comics. So on my list of top 10 image comics, I would put I would put Eric Shanao's Age of Bronze for sure. All right. Now. Let me get rid of the last of the honorable mentions. And these are the I would say these are the top quality honorable mentions, ones that I really, really wanted to include, but just couldn't because I ran out of room. I'm probably out of room anyway, but I've got more coming up for the top 10. So Descender, I haven't read Ascender, as I said earlier, I have read Descender, I thought Descender was fantastic. Again, I, I like artificial intelligence, I like stories about uh, robots and machinery and uh, trying to live next to humans or try to understand the uh, human world. And Descender also has this amazing watercolor art by Dustin Yun, which gives the whole thing a sort of fairy tale elegy kind of feeling, um, no matter how cyberpunky, Mad Maxy it gets. Uh, this is reminiscent to me of uh, the Steven Spielberg movie AI. It has some similarities, but it's not it's not the same thing. Uh, but of course, you've got the Pinocchio metaphor and 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 things like that. Uh, but just a beautiful comic that some people I think 
weren't happy with the end. I thought it worked just fine for me. Uh, but now that there's a sequel series out, I'm interested in seeing what that does with this story, uh, if it does or uh, changes anything at all. Um, but yeah, that was that was that was tough to leave out, as was uh, Warren Ellis and Ben Temple Smith's Fell. I think this is definitely from Image, but I, I'm not sure. It might have been somewhere else. The trade paperback that I have is is Image, and this came this came very close because this is a superb uh, story. It's got claustrophobia and it's got this starkness at it that doesn't seem um that doesn't seem show offy at all like with one or two of the others i do wish there was more of it this feels a little slight uh, but then again only because it's so inviting and so enrapturing that you kind of feel a little cheated uh, when you're out of it. And I don't mean that from a page count point of view. There are plenty of books that we know are complete full stories in even fewer pages than this. It just feels like there should be more of this story. Um, I'm happy to have this, but it's it's quite a tease because it says one. And um, I, think, I think maybe they're going to work on it again. So I'm waiting for more of that. And who knows if it completes and rounds itself out in a way that really works for me, this might come in and uh, and remove things um from that so these two are pretty pretty good hard uh recommendations but they don't make they don't make the they don't make the final list um warren ellis also has injection which i think i'm uh, less enamored with the plot and more a fan of the the art by Declan Shelby and the colors by Jordi Belair. It it does have it does have a lot on its mind. It is very ambitious, um, but but not all the way there. And Image Comics does have anthologies, although I don't think they're very popular, or I haven't gotten my hands on many. I have one called Afterworks, or uh, two volumes of Afterworks. But an anthology I would like to mention is Liquid City, um, which is edited by Sonny Liu, who did the art of Charlie Chan Hok Chai, a comic that I really love. And he edited this with a number... This is all Asian artists and creators uh, in comics. And like all anthologies, it has a variety of styles, including this wonderful piece by Sunny Liu himself. Uh, I, I really love his art style. But any any page you turn to will give you a very drastic look. And some of these names, like Sunny Liu, like uh, Jerry Alangulan, are popular names, are, are people we know. But the vast majority of them, at least me, I had never heard of. And what I love about anthologies like this is finding that story that really works for you, getting into the, the credits to see, oh, who is that? All right, Ken Fu. Do, can I find more comics by Ken Fu? Uh, as a sampler to get you started with a whole bunch of different artists uh, you're not aware of or may not be aware of through some superb selections uh, of work. Not everything is a hit, but uh, there's more hits in this anthology than misses, uh, which is... Which is good for an anthology. I like that ratio. Um, Liquid City is something I would recommend. Okay, all right. That's 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 the lot of them done. I think I think at this point of time, we're in the home stretch. That's just uh, just just a few more to go. I say as I look at this pile of eight books. How can I have eight books left if I'm making a top ten? Uh, All right. So, what do I have left? Oh, all right. Here are some more honorable mentions. Paper Girls was a good was a good series. Uh, I finally finished it, and I was satisfied. Again, I think Brian K. Vaughan people may may not like, or some people do like Brian K. Vaughan, but did not like Paper Girls. I thought it was different, and it's different enough from something like Saga, where you don't have to make comparisons. Where and, and especially the artist collaborations. I really, really, really loved uh, Cliff Chiang's art on this series. 
Uh, but also I like this series for experimenting and going in directions that I didn't expect. Uh, and I think this is something that Brian K. Vaughan has, as a writer, uh, won me over with. Uh, I think sometimes it goes off the rails, but I think for the most, the 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 risks that he's willing to take um, pay off. And that's what I felt about this. It was a fun read. It was it it was very enjoyable, and it kind of held my attention throughout. There wasn't no there was no point in the story, even if it wasn't as exciting as what came before or something like that. There was no point in the story where I felt ah, I'm done with this. I don't want to read anymore. Obviously, since I finished it, so Paper Girls would definitely be a um, an honorable mention, and I believe this is my last honorable mention would be The Wicked and the Divine, where when I was talking about all those other comics, uh, Manhattan Project and, uh, you know, the white covers, Alex and Ada, etc. The Wicked and the Divine, again, I think because of the white covers of the trades, I'm also classifying into that group of things. But this this surprised me with how clever and imaginative, which all these books are, how clever and imaginative it continued to be you know, st issue after issue, story after story. And it was also a very, it's one of those reads where it's easy to glide over these pages. It's easy to understand what's going on, which is for something that is as heady and as convoluted in its mythology as it is, like a lot of those other books that I was talking about, um, you know, which didn't appeal to me in spite of being that brainy just because it couldn't quite draw me in East of West or uh, Pretty Deadly. This did. <laughs> the Wicked and the Divine ended up being one of those uh, series that, okay, you've got all these ideas and all this mythology, but it's still working for me as characters. I could keep them in mind. And that's something that I felt for Paper Girls as well, is I, I could keep all the characters. I could keep track of them. I knew who was who. I knew what they were interested in, but they weren't one-dimensional. And... What the story ended up being about was very much based on the characters and their decisions, not because the plot wanted to move it that way. And so even if you have something epic, even if you have something grand and the machinery of the universe is, is, is propelling you forward, it still ends up being the individual choices that make a difference. And that's the kind of storytelling that I think I really respond to, the ones that, 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 that know that and build the stories around that. So there you go. Those are all my honorable mentions, I believe. And the reason I say I believe is because what I've come, what I've got coming up is probably um, my big cheat. So let me quickly check my list to say, have I gone through everything that I meant to? I mentioned Sex Criminals, Descender, East of West, Sleeper, Fatal, Happy, Ice Cream Man. I couldn't find my copies of Ice Cream Man. That was another honorable mention I had. Jupiter's Legacy, Alex and Ada. Uh, yes. All right. And I found this note right at the bottom of my notes, which I should have put right at the beginning when I was talking about things like stray bullets that don't classify because Kabuki is something I thought of, but it's not originally published. Um... It's not originally published by Image. Uh, so David Max Kabuki, I talked about Private Eye. Grew the Wanderer <laughs> was one of the first things I wanted to say when I was thinking of my top 10 Image comics. But Grew the Wanderer has been published by so many different publications. I first encountered Grew the Wanderer in Image comic collections. That's when I read them. So I think of Grew as an Image comic, but of course, Grew is not an Image comic. But if Grew was... I think I think Gru would have to remove some of the people from my top ten in order to make uh, in order to make room for himself. Uh, but since since we have since we have no more left, I would now like to talk about an author who I think embodies image. And the reason why this is a bit of a cheat is because I have four comics by them in front of me and uh, I didn't know which one I wanted to put in my top 10 image comics although I, I, I'm i picking one uh, 
because we talked about Spawn and all of those, um, the, the way it started and then the resurgence, the thing about image, the speculative fiction, science fiction, fantasy, idiosyncratic voices, things you haven't seen before, weird shapes, colors, etc. I don't think anyone does it better than Brandon Graham. And I love almost everything by Brandon Graham I've read particularly his creator-owned solo writing and drawing work, starting with Multiple Warheads. But I don't know if Image reprinted Multiple Warheads. Uh, I think they were self-published. It may even have been borderline pornographic and then cleaned up for a reprint or something like that. I'm not sure. This is bubblegum... Bubblegum science fiction is the way I've started talking about it. It's Mobius inspired, obviously, but with a whole new thing, which is a sense of manic humor, uh, puns and language, uh, language and symbols and signs, the representation of society around you, the representation of uh, what the world is. I think if I was to talk about Brandon Graham, I would be, I, I would say that he's the person who shows and tells in equal degree. And, you know, when people say you've got to show, don't tell, like, no, you read uh, some great writers and they will be telling you things all the time. And um, that's, that's the way, that's the way Brandon Graham works. He knows when to make something a notation. He knows when to make something um, a reference to like, this is what's going on in this panel, or this is the item he's holding. And I found that to be the case with all of his books. And he'll use very similar techniques in something like Prophet uh, from something like King City. And at first glance, there's nothing, there's, there's nothing similar to these things, but there is, it's, it's that, it's that way of filling you in what's going on in this world. What does this world have? Um, I'm trying to find a, I'm trying to find a particular, but you, anyone who has read Brandon Graham will know what I'm talking about, which is the little insets and the little labels telling you what the items are. And you will find this in almost any comic by him that you read. I think you can see some of those over there. It's, and, and you'll see this in many comics in which you'll open a kit and they'll tell you what all of this, this is a knife and this is a scope. And But what Brandon Graham does is he'll give you a description of it with just enough odd words where the individual words make sense, but putting them together doesn't make any sense. But it's because they're put together in that way that you know you're in the future or that you know that you're on another planet or in another dimension. It's that kind of storytelling that unites his... Um, ridiculous, jokey pun stuff with his epic space uh, science fiction. Prophet is 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 a comic that I don't know if I understood, but I was enthralled by. And I don't mean that you know I didn't understand any of it. It's just like there are lots of things that I didn't understand, but it didn't matter because it was almost as if here I am talking about bigness, here I am talking about largeness. And this is particularly interesting to me because there have been so many times, uh, even in this live stream, when I mentioned um, those comics that have those big ideas and those big universes not connecting with me at an emotional level. And Prophet doesn't really have, here's a likable character or here's a romance that you're going to be invested in. It doesn't work that way. It is also big and epic and full of ideas and here's different kinds of planets and different kinds of creatures with different situations. It's, it shouldn't be something that appeals to me if those things didn't appeal to me, but it does because the skill of his storytelling, of his science fiction storytelling, of his creating the context, creating the world is absolutely unparalleled. And the most recent addition to this is <laughs> Rain Like Hammers, which was praised by... A sleepy, sleepy reader is still here. Comic Crack is here. Good to see you. Earl Grey, Sleepy Reader, both named this their number one comic of last year. And I was like, Brandon Graham? Well, I'm, I'm in. And it's the same thing. Here is a universe. Here is entire context given to you in these stories 
where you are laughing at the same time as you are feeling melancholy, as you feel despair, as you feel the thrill of discovery. And what the character is going through and what the reader is going through are so different and yet united that it's really difficult for me to understand how he does this. But whether it's Multiple Warheads, which is that collection, I think on my list, on this list, I'm going to put King City because this is just a magnificent, fantastic book which makes me laugh uh, every time I read it and also makes me wonder at the, the the size of this guy's imagination. Rain Like Hammers is too fresh in my mind for me to make that that decision, but it's it's definitely a culmination in I I would say that Rain Like Hammers to me was like King City and multiple warheads on one hand and Prophet on the other hand mushed together. You know, getting the intimacy of this and getting the the the, the scope of that, even though these are all these are all science fiction stories. But as I said, very different kind of science fiction than you might be expecting. Uh the colors, the shapes, the curviness has a lot to do with how you think of this science. It's it's almost organic more than machine, even when you're talking about uh, nanotechnology and things like that. And, and, and that's the way his stories are, trying to get to something organic through all this artifice, through all this machinery, through all this edifice. Um, amazing, amazing stuff. And... I could I could easily put profit. I could easily put rain like hammers onto my top ten list. Uh, I'll just put King City and represent this entire this entire stack as 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 one thing, so as not to be uh, accused of cheating. By, as if any of you fine people would uh, do that. Um, and so that brings me to my. <gasps> I was gonna say to my last two, but I actually have three. All right, this is probably other than, other than, yeah, other than Rain Like Hammers, this is probably the most recent read. And it's also an unusual, it's a one shot from Image and we don't get many one shots over here. It's difficult to get. So I know that Image has a history of uh, one shot comics out there, but unless they get anthologized or collected in an edition, I'm probably not going to get my hands on any of them, but I did get my hands on Hedra by Jesse Lonergan. And this is, uh, you may already have heard of this, you may have never heard of this. This is Astonishing Comics. And this is, this is like, how can I describe this? It's as if Chris Ware decided to do a Brandon Graham story. It's about space. It's about exploration. It's about discovery. It's about contact. It's about uh, civilizations or individuals uh, coming together and moving apart and the mystery of what's out there. But it's also very much about comics. It's very much about time and space and it's about reading and it's about emphasis on this or emphasis on that. It's an unusual, absolutely wordless comic which is as much about design as it is about the plot. And that might seem a little much. I think you could be, you know, you could be forgiven for saying that seems just like a whole bunch of pretension until you read it. Because if, uh, if it didn't work, then it would be pretension. But the way that your eye is led across the page, the way that your eye takes in a page and the effect that you get and then where it goes, that emotion where it goes as the plot of the story or as the scenes of the story unfold in front of you are remarkable. Uh, you know, I'm not joking when I say it feels like the geometric precision of Chris Ware or maybe a lot of other people that I'm you know, not aware of. But space travel and the expansion of human existence or civilization has never has never looked like this. I've never seen it look like this. And at the same time, you can be some of these things could be straight out of Starlight or you know Flash Gordon or something like that. It's the it's the marriage of that form and content that makes Hedra such an 
interesting, unusual and remarkable work. I I had to put it on there because there's nothing, there's really nothing else like this. Okay. And now I'm going to end with two graphic novels. So I think we've talked about a number of series, long series, mini series, and uh, Hedra is the one shot. But there have been a number of standalone graphic novels that uh, Image has published, just like Dark Horse and just like, and I, I'm, I'm not sure how many of them I've actually read or gotten my hands on, but the two that I will end with are Beowulf by Santiago Garcia and David Rubin. And this might be, because I think this is an image book, but this might be a reprint of something that was published uh, in Spanish first. But maybe it's a parallel print, you know, like those uh, Brian Talbot books that come out from Jonathan Cape and Dark Horse at the same time. Uh, maybe it's that. In which case, even if it's not, I'm going to count it as image because it's a standalone one volume read. It is a highly dynamic, um, very liquid, uh, very adult uh, extremely, extremely uh, pleasurable to look at, of course, with David Rubin's art and colors telling of the epic story of Beowulf. It's, its main triumph, I think, in is how dangerous and sinewy it, it, it makes Grendel and, this, uh, and, and these battles. It's it's kind of like, um, well, this one, because he's naked and he's fighting at night, etc. It's never felt, and I've, I've I've read a couple of different versions of Beowulf. I think I have three different comics versions of Beowulf because I'm always interested in seeing how this was translated. Um, this sequence, among many others, it's like that uh, Viggo Mortensen fight sequence in... Um, of course, I'm going to blank now. Eastern Promises? Eastern Promises. It's like that fight sequence with the xenomorph of Alien. But but that's not that's not it. It's not just the fight sequences. It's the way that legend and myth and masculinity, all of these things are served up. This is a gorgeous book, but it's also extremely potent as a modernization of something that's been around for a long time. It feels very contemporary. It feels very dynamic. It's it's slick, but it's also weighty and it kind of resonates it's one of the best versions of beowulf i've ever encountered so this is also one of those books that i immediately thought of you know when i was thinking top 10 image comics i was like oh beowulf has to be in there i was like oh was it an image comic and like, i'm not going to look it up because i'm going to keep it in there so beowulf and the last uh the last book is i kill giants by uh, Joe Kelly and J.M. Ken Nimura. This is uh, this is a, like a larger, slightly larger edition, but any edition you can get this book in, I would highly, highly recommend it. Uh, I Kill Giants is the story of this girl who considers herself a giant killer and protector of the realm, the realm being our everyday, normal 20th, 21st century world. The, the presentation of her is extremely sympathetic, but also quite stark. There's obviously, uh, there's obviously mental illness of some kind, or if not illness, it's a sort of reaction or it's a shield of of how this girl sees the world around her and interacts with the world around her and all of the attempts of uh, anyone around her to try to communicate how they completely fail, but also how horrible that life around her is. This manifestation is both in the realistic world as well as this other world in which giants are attacking humanity and she's our only hope. I think there's been like a TV movie version of this, etc. And I think there might be of some others also. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't read it, but that's not... I would say read this comic if you haven't read it. 
uh, find it and read it. This is one of the most beautiful depictions of um, teen high school life that I've seen. And there are lots of them, right? And, and, and many of them are very, very good. So it really has its work cut out to try and compete with some of those things out there. And I think it really does. It's a fantastic story of loneliness and mental anguish and heroism. And it goes uh, to places that might surprise you. I don't hear a lot of people talking about Eichel Giants when they talk about image comics, but I've always, from the very first day I read it, uh, I was like, ah, that's what image comics is. They're, they're the guys who publish this. They're the guys who want to do these kind of stories. And that's why for me personally, in spite of all these other things that we have talked about and all of these other things that we know of, I, that's why I have such a weird idea of image comics. And that's why I think of image comics the way I do. It's because of, it's because of I Kill Giants. It's like they're the, they're the publishing company. They're the publishing house that published this comic. Um, I love this comic. And I think this one was uh, a close... I, I think all of these were pretty close uh, to be my number one pick. I did explain why I ended up picking Astro City. But you can't really compare Astro City to <laughs> to Hedra, to I Kill Giants, to Beowulf, to King City. There is, you know, as the cliche goes, something for everyone. And that's what I think makes Image such a terrific publisher. And uh, that's my top 10. I don't know if it was top 10. I, I don't know how many I actually ended up saying are on my list. But you can say that, okay, if that was not originally image, then I'm not going to count that. Or if you haven't read the full thing, then I'm not going to let you count that. Uh, Saga is still going on. Uh, I haven't read any of the new issues of Saga. But but that's 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 it. I think I've finally gotten to the... I did spot a couple of other honorable mentions behind me, but I'm not, I'm not turning back and getting those right now. This is it for this evening. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, on this live stream. I'm glad that so many of you have stuck around for so long. I did not expect this to go as long as it did. Although that's a lie. I completely did expect it with these many comics and it being me. But uh, I hope you enjoyed this live stream. I had a great time. I hope you enjoyed these comics. If you've not read some of these, I would urge you to check them out. And if you have some comics that you think I've left out or misjudged, let me know in the comments. Uh, I'm going to go through the chat once, uh, you know, once this video is rendered and the chat is up to make sure that I've found everything um, over here. Um, I Kill Giants is fantastic when you... Uh, I didn't think I was going to like I Kill Giants as much as I did. Excellent. I'm glad to see there are people out here with uh, talking about I Kill Giants. Um, but yes, uh, again, uh, somebody might not like it. Somebody might find that it's... Uh, obvious maybe uh, and and I completely agree with that I think a lot of these books like I was talking about earlier a lot of these books it's not about not being able to have a criticism or not agreeing with criticism a lot of these books especially when making personal lists are always going to be about how do I how do those criticisms not matter as much or how do I love this in spite of the flaws that I can see within it in spite of it is very different from denying those flaws exist. It's really about craft. So uh, again, I don't think there'll be things that'll be like everybody will love it, uh, but that's just my personal list and the reasons why I do. So hopefully I've given some sort of idea of the thought process, but I'd love to continue discussing these in the comments of this video, in future videos. But now it is almost 1.30 in the morning here in India, I do have to work tomorrow, which is what that work document that I kept popping up has reminded me throughout this live stream. But once again, thank you so much for joining me on this live stream. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I had a great time and take care. I'll see you at the next video. Have a good night, good day, good afternoon.